Good evening. The board met in closed session prior to the regular portion of the meeting. The board took action on the following items. In closed session, the board moved to approve the terms of settlement agreement and special education student 01152020-10 and authorize the superintendent to execute the agreement on behalf of the district. And then uh, in closed session, the board voted to release two administrators from their administrative positions pursuant to Ed Code 44951 and reassign to certificated classroom or support positions. Thank you, Derek. And I'd like to ask Brandon, our student representative, to lead us in the pledge and the color, bring the color guard out. The commander and U.S. flag bearer for this evening is for this evening's color guard is Cadet Captain Aiden Fitzer. The state flag is carried by Cadet Lieutenant Colonel Matthew Priest. The right guard. Cadet Captain, I mean Cadet Master Sergeant Ronan Culkin. The left guard is Cadet Captain Isabel Burkhalter. Tonight's alternates are Cadet Captain Herschel Sabnis, Cadet Captain Jenna Anderson, Cadet Captain Russell Bora, Cadet First Lieutenant John Wong, Cadet Master Sergeant Brandon Utterback, and Cadet Airman Heaven Green. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the presentation of the colors by Whitney High School Air Force Junior ROTC Color Guard and the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, we will now uh, open it up uh, for public comment. This agenda item is included to give anyone in attendance an opportunity to ask questions or discuss non-agenda related items with the Board of Trustees. So if you're here to speak about the budget or a specific item on the, um, on the agenda, we'll get to that later. This is specifically for someone who wants to talk to a non-agenda item, uh, budget item. Uh, there is three minute time limit per person. Members of the public utilizing a translator address the board shall be limited to a six minute time limit per person unless the board agrees to extend the time beyond six minutes. A complaint about specific employees of the district shall be made to that employee's immediate supervisor or the principal as required by administration regulation 1312.1. So with that, is there anyone that would like to speak to the board about a non-agenda related item? And if you could, sorry, if you could also just uh, say your name and the city you're from, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Nancy Muir, and I'm from Rockland, California. Um, today I stand for you exactly one year ago. Um, my husband and I stood in front of the board to discuss um, the meaning of today. Today is spread the word to end the word. Last year, we were told that you were going to look into it, that policies were being written, rewritten for this district for our kids with special needs. We've been waiting a year for these policies. I've asked several times to teachers and administrators at Whitney High School, only to be told they know nothing about these policies that were being rewritten so that kids with special needs and disabilities are included in activities. We were also promised that um, spread the word, end word information was going to be distributed so that families and the kids knew what today was about. Been waiting, got nothing, what's going on? Kathy, you promised another promise broken, another amount of lip service handed to our children. It's got to stop and it's got to stop now. Our kids are too important. And if you continue with this, it's going to just explode even more than it already has. Please follow through and do something that you promised. Hi, 
my name is Chelsea Jones. I live in Citrus Heights. I'm a teacher here in Rockland Unified. Uh, I'm speaking today on Schools and Communities First, which is the ballot initiative that the teachers union, along with other local community agencies like nurses and firefighters, are sponsoring and supporting for the November 2020 ballot. We're collecting signatures today to get it a proposition number. It still doesn't quite have a number yet. Uh, when it does have a number, we're asking that the board endorse and support this initiative. For Rockland Unified alone, it is estimated to bring in $8.5 million yearly annual revenue. How it does this is by closing corporate and industrial property tax loopholes in the current tax code in California, and it's estimated to bring in $7 billion to $12 billion in, the, in all of California for schools and communities. So we urge you to please support the initiative, even if it doesn't have a proposition now. If anyone in the audience would like to sign to make sure that it's guaranteed to be on the November ballot, please come see me. I have more literature, I have numbers, I also have candy. Thanks. Thanks, Chelsea. Good evening. Good evening. Hey, uh, my name is Tommy Pringle, uh, parent of TJ, uh, Tommy Pringle II, uh, student at Rukele Elementary um, in Rockland. Um, standing before you today in reference to a discrimination matter um, and seeking to understand what other controls and or actions can or will take place um, in reference to the discrimination issue that took place at Rockland, um, excuse me, at Rukele in Rockland. Um, I did leave a message on um, Dr. McDonald's uh, phone yesterday, didn't receive a response, so felt the need to come out today um, to seek action, need to understand what's going to take place because it, it, it can't continue. Um, and it doesn't seem like um, enough is being done about it. I know there should be controls um, around it, but it seems like your controls are failing um, because it's not the first time this has happened to my son at that school, right, in the last few months. So to remove the risk, is my request, um, seeking for that to be done, and if not, other actions will be taken on my end. All right. Yeah, because as a, as a mom, I should not have to fear or worry that something's gonna happen to my child. It's unacceptable. You guys keep the same kid in the school, and I have to worry as a mom whether or not he's gonna get, I don't know, in a casket. Discrimination and bullying should not be tolerated at all. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address the board? Okay, with that, I'd like to ask uh, Chuck Haddox, the president of CSA, to join us for his report. Good evening, Board of Trustees, Superintendent Stock. Tonight you are all, or tonight you all, as the Board of Trustees, is faced <coughs> with making some difficult decisions. Um, Some of these decisions have to do with possible cuts to some positions. I'm here tonight to tell you that we need these people and we need, we need them to be in their current positions. These classified employees work very hard at what they do. Some of these positions are very thankless positions and the repercussions will not be noticed now but after they're gone. I don't believe that the district realizes how important these classified employees are to maintaining the organization, health, well-being, and the cleanliness um, that, they, that they do for you, me, the kids, and the staff of the school district. At, and with that being said, I myself would like to say thank you to each and every classified employee for doing such a fantastic job. Thank you all. On another note though, we don't believe that the district has looked deep enough into their own pockets to justify making the cuts that are necessary to make the budget work. We all think that the district has decided to make cuts to positions instead of looking at how the budget is being spent. 
Before I had taken this position as lead custodian and the president of Chapter 773, I was in construction for many years. In that time, I had built schools as a union iron worker, went to trade school to study to be an inspector, and took construction management courses. And with my knowledge in construction and the way that I see things being managed within the district, there's a whole lot of stuff construction-wise that can be planned and dealt with to make our budget work. So please consider these thoughts before making that final decision on making cuts to staff and make a little more time into looking into ways to make, to make cuts. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. We'll now turn to the Rockland Teachers Professional Association uh, uh, report. Travis Munia. Good evening, board members, Rockland Unified employees, parents and community members, and students of Rockland Unified. I want to begin by saying thank you to the board and their support staff for going out of your way to accommodate the potential large crowd tonight. I think that speaks volumes after what happened at the last meeting. I'm optimistic that the fire marshal won't be showing up tonight to tell us that there's too many of us in the room to talk about the important things we need to talk about. I'm also optimistic that maybe it's just my overthinking and my conspiracy theory brain. When I look at the labels on public board docs week to week, and we label our action items as approve item X, Y, and Z, and maybe I'm overthinking that that approval label is a predetermined outcome before this meeting has even started. I'm optimistic hoping that that's just part of the process. It may be part of the process that needs to be revisited, revisited for future meetings and future action items being on our agenda. As you can see, I've got a team standing behind me. They're gonna speak on some, some important things tonight, along with many people in the audience that I know have very strong opinions on the things that are being discussed tonight. Before I hand over the microphone specifically to Joe and Emily, I want to go on record and state that as the president of the Rockland Teachers Professional Association, we, RTPA, and I myself refuse to accept that any budget crisis even exists or that any cuts are needed for this or the 2021 school year. Joe in a moment is going to speak more specifically, specifically to this, but before he does, I want to point out that the information that we are providing and Joe is going to speak to came directly from Rockland Unified staff at the district office. With that said, I'm going to turn things over to Joe and we're going to pass a few documents out to you board members since the screen's behind you guys. Good evening, board members, superintendent stock, parents, colleagues, community members. Um, we have a credibility issue in Rockland Unified with regards to budgets. And I wanted to, we, I've been involved with bargaining off and on for nearly 20 years now. And we have all along felt that there's a fairly clear pattern of predicting dire budget numbers and then in the end when the actuals occur a big pot of money falls out of the bottom and so I spent some time last night uh, digging through budget documents the interim reports and then the actuals and data entered and present this to you here uh, you need to look at this in columns I will look at the 2010-11 column for example at the earliest point on the 2008-2009 first interim report, Rockland Unified projected that their ending fund balance would be about $5.3 million. And then every successive number underneath that column shows the next projection for ending fund balance for that school year. And then if you look at the bottom in the bolded number, that's the actual ending fund balance that occurred. So it's pretty clear when you look across that document, we have a long-standing pattern of predicting budget crises 
And then in the end, the actual ending fund balance turns out to be substantially more than what was predicted. The numbers in blue are the delta, the difference between the initial projected ending fund balance and what actually occurred for each year. And then below that is the ending fund balance expressed as a percent of the total revenue for that school year. So I think you can understand why when you come to us and you say there's a crisis, and essentially you're saying you need to trust us, that's kind of a non-starter. And that speaks to the process too. I think that there's really two points here. One, there has not been the opportunity or the time to really engage with the community, with the district budget office, with the teachers, to actually verify that there is a crisis. And then second, we went straight from the rumors of a crisis to a list of solutions and nothing in between. And so again, there was no opportunity for parents and the community and the teachers to have input in a real way into what those items actually were. So that's where we are. There's been a long-standing pattern of budget projections that didn't turn out to be credible. And here we are again in a situation where we have a declared budget crisis and we're being asked to take that on faith. And then additionally, we've had a process where nobody really got the opportunity to have input into the menu of items that you place before us as part of the budget cut ideas. So my opinion is we probably need to push pause on this for at least a year and actually engage in a true process where everybody can be part. That's what I have. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Joe. I know that along with doing all of that data analysis, you also have a regular teaching job of eighth grade math at Springfield Middle School. And I know on behalf of myself and the community members in the room and in the community, thank you for your time for our students. So as we can see from the little bit of a glimpse Joe was able to give us in that brief presentation, the trust needed to even consider that there is a crisis or cuts are even necessary any time in this or next school year especially is something that just can't be accepted and will not be tolerated without standing here and asking you and asking you and asking you because that's sometimes what it takes to get some of that action, like Joe said, to reconsider, to push the pause button because from the presentation we saw last month, the crisis doesn't exist for three years out. So why are we jumping to put out the fire now that might happen in three years? This board certified a budget to go three years last year at the end of negotiations, and here we are the following year saying we can't afford it. We're in crisis, we gotta cut. So my question, one of my many questions for you board members, the five of you specifically, is how and why should RTPA, along with the students of Rockland Unified, the parents, and community members of Rockland trust that these budgets that are presented to us year after year and approved with glowing commendations, sometimes even flowers, are more than just a tactic around bargaining and conveniently timed in the spring. So if the numbers continue to show growth in the bottom line, but crisis in the front headlines, why would anybody trust the information being presented to us in a public meeting? I know as a classroom teacher, if my lessons or my subject knowledge didn't add up, I'd be held accountable. 
And I'm hopeful that you, the board, will do the same thing and hold those high expectations to every employee in Rockland Unified, whether they serve in a classroom, they serve in an office, or they serve in some other supportive role. Before we're done tonight, I want to invite our next team member, Ms. Emily Thomas, who's a ninth and 10th grade language arts teacher at Whitney High School, to speak on some of the potential impacts if you were to vote any cuts on tonight's agenda. Cuts in funding and staffing and programs and how those might impact the students we serve, the students and parents that employ you as board members to trust the education and the future of their children. Emily. Good evening, board members. Good evening, Superintendent Stock. Thank you so much, uh, parents, community members, fellow teachers, students, for being here tonight. Um, I'd like to pose my discussion as questions because you do have the opportunity to respond to any one of the questions that are asked of you during this RTPA time. So my first question for you, Board, Superintendent Stock, is did you know that your business services projected the cost of eliminating freshman sports to be $98,000? Did you know that according to the athletic directors at both high schools, the actual cost is anywhere between $54,000 and $70,000. That margin of error is 45%. Did you know? Now, I received an email in my inbox on February 28th that stated, there will be no elimination of ninth grade sports programs due to restructuring. How did we do this as a district? We've identified additional reductions elsewhere in the budget. Did you know, particularly community members, that that money is not coming from the district office, as far as I know? So my question to you is, the implication of that email is that the district will be putting forth the money for freshman sports. Is that accurate? I would like you to answer the it's, question. It's your, it's your or go time, on so let me know how you. Totally, yeah. Answer the question or go on record. So, as no, you if, you, if you read the email, what, what it clearly said was you're talking about the context of the entire thing. It wasn't just about freshman sports, it was also about. So, uh, your answer is no. So, then I'll clarify that. Well, I think the implication from, just so you know, community members is the district is going to fund sports. And I think what everyone in this room needs to understand is that our athletic director said, I quote, we cannot wait around for the board to make a decision that might hurt our athletics and the students who depend on those athletic programs. And so they came together and decided that the taxpayers sitting behind me will pay an increased voluntary athletic contribution. Students, instead of watching football games, will work concession stands. Students will sell parking spaces instead of sitting in the stands being part of the athletic event. The teachers, the students, the athletes, the parents, the taxpayers, have saved freshman sports. And I want everyone in this room to understand that the district has not reprioritized freshman sports. The district has not reorganized anything. So it sounds like transparency is the goal from both sides. And I think we can all agree that in order for transparency to exist, we need honesty and we need accuracy. And the implications of that email are that honesty is something that we need to work toward. And I'm, I'm open to that. Um, what I would like to ask the board and Superintendent Stock is in preparing for this meeting, I wanted to go today onto the Depart Department of Education for California's government website and look into our English learner data. I was very surprised to find out that on our California school dashboard, the performance levels for all students on state indicators illuminate by district. You can see that. I was able to see our chronic absenteeism, our graduation rate, our college and career <clears throat> indicator. The one indicator that was turned off, unavailable, was English learner progress. Did you know that's not information that this community has access to. Okay. One year. So I think that, that's okay, all right. So I think that that was, for us, 
surprising to find out we didn't have access to that information. Um, my final question for you guys, again, so that we can hopefully achieve transparency through honesty and accuracy, is in looking through our LCAP. And for people who aren't familiar with LCAP, it's pretty much how the schools get funded. It's, it's a list of our celebrations, what the district does really well. We set forth goals and then action plans so that we can be held accountable. All right, goal number one, our USD will ensure all students achieve and make continuous progress toward increasingly challenging and academic goals. All students. Our USD will ensure all students achieve. The action plan for that promise made several years ago in the LCAP was, our USD will implement research-based academic and linguistic approaches to target and support the success of TK through 12 English learners. I don't know how we support gains in our English learners when the district plans to reduce 2.6 FTE English language teacher positions. Do you know? My next question. Goal number two, our USD will provide support systems for learning and provide safe schools with healthy climates where all students feel safe and have the opportunity to achieve at high levels. All right, action plan written by our USD members, action plan, establish an inclusive culture where diversity and individual differences are valued and celebrated. How can we tell our children that we value and celebrate diversity when our board suggests that we eliminate 2.6 English language teacher positions? We have to lead by example. So again, how do we do that when the people in charge are making these decisions? Um, finally, in the LCAP, and then I'll wrap up, our greatest progress was that the suspension rate of our English learners had decreased by 1.1%. The graduation rate of our English learners had increased by 4.6%. What is going to happen to that success story when you take teachers out of the classroom? I don't have an answer, but I don't think it's an answer that we want to explore. And I would ask the board tonight and Superintendent Stock to consider the promises you made when you wrote that LCAP document. You received funding based on promises that we would include all students and we would, we would provide gains for all students. And that is simply not what is going on in your current budget reduction plan. So again, let me end with transparency requires honesty and accuracy two things we are sorely lacking in this district right now. Thank you for your time. Travis. Are we? Travis. So just to answer the concern on freshman sports, because I was very integral, part of the whole process. So when this came up in, in prior board meetings and had the conversation, I know the athletic directors would reach out to on their own, went through, came up with a way of how do we solve this problem. So they went down, sat down, talked with the coaches. It is a voluntary athletic contribution. It's not a mandatory, it's a voluntary. We are asking, yes, we are asking every parent out there who has a freshman sport, a, hand, a JV sport or a varsity sport to pay a little more. And over that overall budget, we'll spread that out and be able to cover the freshman sport coaches stipends. Now, if that doesn't cover it, hey, we can cover some, we can do some parking, we can do some uh, food service or snack bar type stuff. Those were ideas that were brought about, had a problem, came up with a solution, and that's where we're at. So it's not, it's, and I think that's a great process, right? We have a problem, we identified something, and they came to the floor and they made that happen. And I think that's a very good thing to do. Now I get, as a parent, and I paid them, you have to pay that volunteer athletic contribution, yes. And, and it's, that's, that's part of sports, whether it be a freshman sport, JV sport, or varsity sport in our USD, and in most districts and most schools. Yeah, thank you for addressing that. And I think my concern is that there was a problem, member counter, and you didn't say we tried to solve it, you said they solved it. And you're absolutely right. Our athletic directors and our coaches yeah, did a beautiful the job. They did a great job, yes. So again, I want to pick up and, and just say a, um, 
A huge thank you to Emily. Um, like Joe, I know you've put many hours in outside of your regular teaching responsibilities, and I know that as a freshman and sophomore language arts teacher, the challenge is much more vast than I ever could understand in a history classroom and many of us in our own classroom. So thank you, Emily, again. Um, I also want to say thank you, uh, uh, Derek. I'm, I'm not going to go by formalities, but Derek, for your willingness to interact with us, because my understanding of the RTPA time is is the ability for us to have a conversation, not just public comment that we don't have a three minute timer and we talk at you and nobody gets to interact. And so, and Rick as well, I know you tried to, to get in there as well. So I, I wanna say thank you, I appreciate that. However, um, I think there's a reality where the thing in front of us might be a little bit too late and a little bit too little. So like Emily said, there was a, there's we comments used and we comments and things. And, and, uh, and one of the, the things that resonates with me is when the comment about, we talked about this at previous meetings, and I hear the plural on that. And the previous meeting is the one I'm aware of. Um, so I don't know if there's previous meetings where these budget cuts were on the agenda and we had those conversations. I know there was a workshop, um, but my understanding is those workshops are not really as broadcast to be public inclusive. And I know that they all know they're not closed to the public, but or to my understanding, but either way, I think we could do a better job just for future reference on, on advertising those opportunities for ourselves, teachers in the district, uh, members of our bargaining unit, CSEA included, and then our community to come and get that education as well. I think that may have prevented some of this process. That said though, I wanna conclude our time by just saying thank you to the, the many students, parents, community members who have provided input and to the board for accepting that input. I know there was a lot of input received my understanding was well over 500 comments and things were received through that, that format that was provided to the, the community. Um, my question though, and my, my optimism wants to think, is just in wonder. I wonder how could all this have gone and what other creative solutions could have come had we had more than a week, a few weeks, a month between this kind of big announcement and then what is pending on the agenda as already an approved thing or something to be approved by the label on the board docs. So I hope that along with what we shared with you tonight and what I think many people are going to share and echo behind us, that you our school board members will feel empowered to listen to the constituents that are to come speak to you and not feel pressured and not feel like a rubber stamp process, but instead actually show the public, the people that elected you to office to represent them and uphold that excellence of education for their students in our community, that you do value their input and their opinion. And most importantly, your decision tonight reflects that you do put Rockland students under that guise of excellence in education and your actions support it more than just those words that we reference on our board walls week in and week out. Thank you. Travis, I think we recognize that communication is never perfect. You're always trying to stay ahead of it. You're always trying to catch up. I mean, you can talk to my wife. I'm sure I say way too many things at wrong time, and she'll say you should have told me earlier, and I get that. But when we talk about the budget and the process, and even in the data, we have the first interim budget right around December, and that was in a meeting. And then the, on the 22nd, there was a budget study session. And then on the 11th of February, that was the review that we were talking about prior. And then there was a and there was a follow-up meeting with you know with different groups about budget and about the process. So I get we can always do better, but there was steps in the process, and we are going through this process like we've always done. There's always a first interim, a second interim, a May revised, and then you won't really make decisions on this whole thing till you adopt in June. So this is the process. I understand that, but I also understand that there is a process that happens years prior that certified the budget to be something that's sustainable in some forms moving forward. Typically three years is kind of that. The other piece too is I also understand that there's a process. I totally understand and respect that and that hands are tied sometimes. But there's got to be a better way. And the better way, in the opinion of many people, is that we don't make decisions in haste. And even if it started in December and there's been four meetings, December to March 4th is not a lot of time especially when you're talking about education, student programs, and impact in the big picture. So I appreciate that, Derek, but I, again, I, I refuse to accept that that process is the only one. And the last thing I want to say 
is you mentioned that this is the way we've always done it. I think the presentation that Joe said, the way we've always done things, doesn't always lead to put Rockland in the headlines that we want Rockland to be in. Yeah. We just, I just want to point out, like, we do need to recognize that we have to adopt budgets in three-year windows, and every year that window moves. So last year, in order to get a clean three-year budget where we weren't falling negative in the third year, we had to make $2 million of cuts. Now we're in a new year. The window has shifted. What was last year's fourth year is now the third year. And if we don't make these cuts, we're going to be in the red in our third year. And when that happens, if it's three years out, the county will say our budget is qualified meaning unless we make significant cuts, we might go bankrupt. If it's about two years out, the county can step in and say, you have a negative budget, which means we'll appoint a receiver who can come in and just make cuts without any votes and without any agreement with labor or anyone else. So that is, that is the state process that every district in California has to go through. And we have a structural budget deficit which is why we had to make cuts last year, and that's why we're looking at having to make cuts this year. Because again, otherwise that third year, we, if we just say, we're just gonna wait until we're in the final year, and it shows that now next year's the year we start literally bouncing checks, we won't get that far because the county superintendent will step in and appoint a receiver. And we've seen other districts in the state do that, like Oakland, like Inglewood, some of them it happened 10, 15 years ago, and they still haven't gotten out from under just the crippling budget implications of that. So th this is what we have to deal with, but we had to make cuts last year to get it to balance out, and now it's a new year. So yes, our budget was certified and it was clean last year because we made that cuts, but now once again, we're faced with the same reality. If we hadn't made those cuts last year, our budget wouldn't have penciled out, and we would have been in an even worse situation this year. So I would direct you to look at the document I gave you, and no, well. But I don't understand this document because let, what, let me what, let me be specific. But I have a specific instance. You understand that, budgets change. The January budget is so this. Of course, this makes it look like we had no. Uh, they by definition change, and so I would argue this is misleading. I would like, like we just I had would, no idea. Can I can I finish? Yeah, it? sorry, Joe. Take a look at the first two or three columns: 2008-9, 2009-10. We heard the same, although more dire, messages then. There was a point at which 105 teachers got noticed with layoff. And you'll notice that in those years, the same thing happened. Yeah, the, the cuts from the recession. The ending fund balance ended up in one, well, for 2008-9, you projected it to be 1.6 million. It ended up being 12 million. So I understand that you feel you have the responsibility to react to the budget you have, but we've seen time and again the same message, yeah. and in that's, that's the most extreme instance, and I don't think that we identify and execute cuts with the intent of growing the reserve, but that's what it looks like when you look at how the projections square with what ended up actually happening. Right. So, but I, I can mostly speak, I can't speak to that. I wasn't on the board. I can speak to last year's budget because I was on the board. That's, we did not grow. And reserve. so that's, that our, and I, we I made a choice as a board not to grow the reserve. And so I, when I can speak for this board. That's not accurate. That's not how we've budgeted. What I would also say is, as I look down this, so I guess, Joe, what I struggle with is, I, I, yes, they're off every year and I, I can see, but I don't understand the alternative, which is if we're not conservative, if we under budget and there's less money than we budgeted for, we then have to go real time and make significant cuts afterwards with no anticipation for it. Why, why wouldn't we want to be fiscally prudent in how we budget because we can always replace dollars when we get back. If we, for instance, one thing we're looking at tonight is, is instruments around music. If it turns out the budget's different, we can sort of replace that. But if we don't make that cut and it turns out to be worse, then what happens? Well because history suggests, and again, you weren't here. Right, but, and, fair, and I know you were. 
when you come full circle, that argument comes full circle to say, okay, we're different. You need to trust us this time. And again, like I say, there's a credibility issue yeah. in terms of budgeting. That's not a personal Yeah, comment. I know. I appreciate that's that just a, That's a reality you yeah. have to face when you deal with this constituent group. Yeah. Secondly, it's not just dollars. It's lives. It's people's jobs. Right. It's students. So maybe we're a little too far on the conservative side of the continuum here. It's not an either or. It's a continuum. And history suggests that we've been overly conservative because in each instance, the ending fund balance has been substantially larger Different, yeah. than what was predicted. Okay. Simple as that. I appreciate it. Again, I just want to say thank you for being willing Thanks. to have that. I just wish that it was in a different context and on yeah. a much earlier timeline. Uh, us but thank too. you again. Us too. <laughs> so I appreciate that, Travis. Yeah, thank no, so, Travis, we, like, we do too, <laughs> but we get the governor's budget in mid January, and then staff scrambles to figure out what does that mean. And everyone's trying to listen to the legislature to see is there any indication that maybe the legislature will step in by May and say, we're going to give you more money. And Five years in a row under Governor Brown, that happened. Five years in a row, by the time May came around, the legislature said, we're going to give you more money than that skinflint governor wanted to give you. But we haven't heard anything like that this year, and that's worrying. The, the attitude seems to be, oh, we've taken care of K-12 education. We got you back to where you were before the recession last year. But, but that is the process. Like, it is incredibly compact, and every district in California has to deal with this. But it's... But we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that we are still in that process. The final budget isn't approved until June when, as long as the legislature's on time, which they have been for the last decade, not before that, <laughs> the legislature passes the final budget. And maybe it'll be different. Maybe it'll be worse. Maybe it'll be better. But if we wait until then, it's too late to do anything. And then you are effectively waiting a year. And if we needed to go back and make cuts, we couldn't. And the future cuts, because it compounds, just become worse. So th this is a terrible process that everyone has to deal with, where you're fighting a moving target, and some years it turns out better, and that's great. But I, I don't have any reason to think, based on anything we've heard from Sacramento, or what we've seen in the last month with the coronavirus fears and the stock market, I don't think the economy is going to get better over the next six months to a year than we thought it was going to be in January. And it requires those types of things in order for us to get a May surprise and a lot more money. So it's, it, these are very difficult situations, but thank you. Thanks, I appreciate the conversation, thank you. Okay, I'm now gonna move on to the uh, consent calendar. This agenda item is included to give anyone in attendance, an, oops. Sorry, all matters listed on the consent calendar are to be considered routine and will be enacted by one motion followed by a roll call vote. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless the Board of Trustees, audience, or staff request specific items be removed from the consent calendar for a separate discussion action. <coughs> Any agenda item removed will be voted upon following the motion to approve the consent calendar. Does anyone want to remove an item from the consent calendar? Yes. Yeah, so you need to remove it. I think both uh, yeah. minutes. Will you say it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, can we remove... Items 7.2, board meeting minutes from January 15th, and item 7.3, board meeting minutes from February 11th. Great. Okay. Without any objection. All right. So then, can I have a motion to approve the consent calendar without item <coughs> 7.2 or 7.3? So moved. Moved by Eric. Second by Derek. All those in favor of this, I'm sorry, this roll call vote. Can you call the roll, please? Brandon Vinson Palmaris. Yes. Camille Maven. <laughs> Derek Counter? Yes. Eric Stevens? Yes. Rochelle Price? Yes. Rick Miller? Yes. Now I understand we moved 7.2 and 7.3 because you were both gone for both those meetings? Both gone no, for both? No, no. Split. Okay. Do them separately. So, all right. So, we're going we're gonna, to, uh, can I get a motion to move item 7.2? So moved. Moved by Rochelle. Seconded by, I'll second it. Seconded by me. Uh, all the uh, roll call vote, please. Brandon Vincent Palmaris? Yes. Camille Maven? Yes. Derek Counter? Abstain. Eric Stevens? Abstain. Rochelle Price? Yes. Rick Miller? Yes. Can I have a motion on 7.3? Moved by Camille. 
Second. Second by Rochelle. Uh, roll call vote, please. Brandon Benson Palmeris. Yes. Camille Maben. Yes. Derek Counter. Yes. Eric Stevens. Yes. Rochelle Price. Yes. Rick Miller. Yes. Okay. Um, we skipped comments. Yeah, where were? Six point one. If you want to. Oh, I see. Sorry. Apologies. So we're going to go back and do uh, uh, comments. So. Um, <laughs> so that I can ask our, by the way, I have to brag on our uh, student body president from, uh, um, uh, from Victory High, who actually is a recent graduate from Victory High, who graduated, absolutely. Thank you. We're happy to say he's gainfully employed. He's, he's preparing to go back to school as well for an for a advanced degree, but at this time we'd love to tell you about Victory and an update from the students. So thank you. All right. Parker Whitney, next week is Dr. Seuss week. Parker Whitney, Parker Whitney will be celebrating a love of reading with activities, dress up days, and amazing stories. Twin Oaks Elementary School, fourth graders had, an, had a wonderful experience with a touch of understanding. Third graders are practicing for their annual musical performances of Going Buggy. And our wonderful PTC is ramping up our major fundraiser coming April 1st at Sunset Ranch. Staff, students, and families together continue to focus on providing the highest quality of instruction as well as data-driven targeted in interventions and extensions for all students. In addition, our sixth graders spent the week before break at Walker Creek Ranch in Platuma, oh, Petaluma, sorry, <laughs> during this outdoor education program. Our students received quality science education, strengthened bonds with their peers, and increased their environmental awareness. Looking ahead, all students will be developing valuable skills in performance by participating in our annual dance show at the movies. Performances will take place at 5 p.m. and 7 p.m. on March 31st, April 1st, and April 2nd. Trustees and staff are invited to attend. As a school community, we cherish efforts made by all to make this the year, make this year Hashtag best year ever. And that is all I have to report on. All right, now we'll take board member comments. Uh, any board members uh, have any comments? Yeah. Trustee Price, I'll start with you. Um, just wanted to share, I had, in addition to a few site visits, also wanted to share, I went to a Freedoms Foundation banquet, which was amazing to see that 23 students from Rockland High School, six from Whitney High School were awarded scholarships to attend Valley Forge. A group of them left today, and that was awesome to see them there and celebrate it as well. They um, had a Constitution Bowl, and the Rockland High School team on their own time studied for, prepared for, and won our, our local chapter Constitution Bowl. So just fun to be there and celebrate those students. Derek, do you have any? No? Derek, do you have any? No? Okay, Superintendent Stock, I we have comments. And uh, yes, I, I wanted to just um, mention during my comment time that the um, we have sent out, uh, related to the coronavirus, we, we've been working in close conjunction with the public county health officer, Dr. Amy Sessions, and we appreciate her partnership. She has been amazingly responsive to not just us, but other school districts. And we've sent out uh, several messages to our families and staff. We sent out two today, um, just wanting to make sure we keep people updated. Um, included in those messages were as frequently asked questions that we're hearing, links to the Placer County Public Health Agency for families and staff that want additional information, along with links to the Center for Disease Control. Um, because we know it's important, uh, as always, to provide that information. And, and just wanted to just mention that we are uh, monitoring the situation, adjusting things such as cleaning and other matters as we go, and, and that we will continue to monitor that. Um, in fact, we had a 3.30 call this afternoon with the, uh, the um, head of the Placer County Public Health Agency to, again, just to check in 
in on recent events. So we're continuing to do so, we're continuing to communicate, and we will do so. And again, we just appreciate in advance the support of our community and our, our, our families and our, and, our, and our employees and colleagues as we work through this, uh, is this in the days and weeks to come, it's projected that this will continue for us to all need to monitor and adjust, and, and we will continue to communicate. But just wanted to point those out and that those communications are, have gone out today and, and will continue to as, as we move through this. And, and so again, we have provided those informations and we will be updating information on our website. We've included a link to that. So anyone that wants to see if there's been additional updates can just follow that on our link and, and that will be posted there as well. Um, and with that also, um, we have our, our annual unified uh, basketball game next Thursday. Uh, we're excited to uh, support um, our, all of our students, uh, especially our students with disabilities, as they have an opportunity to participate in an authentic athletic event um, supported by our, our, our students from both Whitney and Rockland, and that is a, a staff-led event, and we are so appreciative of that as well. Thank you, Mr. Superintendent. Okay, with that, we will move on to item action item number eight, approval of budget reductions for the 2021 fiscal year. Um, and I believe, Superintendent Stock, you're going to start the presentation for us? I, I am, and I'm going to ask uh, Deputy Superintendent Patterson to go ahead and pull up the, uh, the presentation. But as she does so, before uh, President Miller and trustees, before I dive into the uh, report and, and on the dis on the discussion related to uh, our budget uh, development and possible reductions. I, I wanted to share a few thoughts, um, and I, I can't be overemphasized that. And we've heard from the community and, and heard tonight, and we'll continue to hear, I'm sure, that how difficult the, these recommendations are. And I can share that these are not easy at all uh, to come up with. I, I know I speak for for myself and, and my colleagues in cabinet and our district leaders team that, that we know these reductions um, impact uh, what goes on in, in, our, in our schools and, and we know that it means doing less with less supplies, less materials and, and in some cases potentially less, less staff members. Um, and, and, and these are hard. Um, we know these are people. Um, for example, uh, the reduction of our instructional coaches and having them return to the classroom. You know, I know are our coaches. I know the impact uh, of their work. I see it when I'm out in schools. Um, and, and I know the impact on, on in keeping our teaching and learning at the highest levels and supporting that. And, and, and those aren't lost as we, as, as we make these, these recommendations. And even, you know, eliminating the receptionist, the district office, you know, Anna is somebody I greet multiple times a day as I walk by. And, and, and she does outstanding customer service. But, but unfortunately, these are recommendations that we need to make. And so just need to note that these are hard and not taken at all lightly by those of us making recommendations for the board to consider. And another thought I wanted to share before I jump into the formal part of this is we've had a community conversation the last several years, and sometimes it's been quiet and sometimes it's been loud, about what the board and district's budget priorities should be. And last year, um, the board made, it, made a decision that was supported by myself and administration and the recommendations we made. And, and, and that recommendation, that change, was to change our priorities to invest more in our employees based on the notion, and I believe it's true, that having the best quality employees in our district, whether it's teachers, principals, custodians, bus drivers, um, working with students and on behalf of students makes a huge difference. And, and that was a recommendation that we made the board approve that direction. It's something last year I supported and I support today um, because I do think it is the right thing to do. As a result of that, we are shifting the spending um, more away from other things and, and into employees. And again, that's a right thing to do because we are, um, we want, we have people working with kids and on behalf of kids. So I, I just, you know, need to share those, those thoughts is before we move into the formal part of the presentation. So with that, I am going to move into the presentation. Um, and tonight, the outcomes of the presentation is to affirm our, our budget priorities, uh, clarify 
present and past factors impacting our budget development, outline some of the impacts of ongoing reductions versus one-time uh, reductions and delays, Re uh, share revised recommendations for budget reductions, um, share budget reductions that have been considered but are not recommended at this time, and identify unknowns in the budget development process at this time, and then share next steps in our budget development process. Um, again, our budget, like other budgets, is built on priorities. And as I shared in, in my just thoughts before the formal part of the presentation, these have shifted in the last year intentionally to reprioritize funds to attract and retain high quality employees. And in a couple examples, um, we have uh, nearly a thousand teachers apply for positions in Rockland Unified last year. We're proud to be uh, a destination district, not just for families, but employees. And the new average new teacher we hired last year had 10 years of experience, which is outstanding for, for our, our students. Um, and also, um, we, we, as a result of, of how we have reprioritized in, in our negotiations, we have uh, more teachers than ever at, at the top of the salary schedule because they can get there in 17 years instead of 25 years, which is the average in our area, eight years sooner. Those are important things because it, it, it really shows that investment. And, and so that's a priority uh, that we, the board made and, and continues to make. Uh, we also want to support student safety, learning, and wellness, support our employees' safety, learning, and wellness, and have systems that support our schools. Um, we also want to just want to share a little bit about that is we, we've shared this in, in, in the fall with our families and employees, some budget information and in our work to try to share more information about our budget. And, and this is just a look at, at a glance. Where does our dollars go? And as you can see on this pie chart that our, out of our budget, 85% or 115 million is, is on employees. And, and that's the right place for it to be. Um, and, it, and it also shows that as we look at reductions and we've worked to target those in the areas of services and supplies and facilities and equipment, that at some point, uh, unfortunately, we may have to have some impact on, on staff as well, just with 85% of our budget uh, being in that category. Um, but there are some questions of how did we get here? And again, it's important, we want to spend some time on this, um, that you know, it's three significant areas play a role in part of how we've got here with these, making these recommendations to reduce the budget. First is our 2019-20 current adopted budget had two factors, deficit spending and reserves at the state minimum level in the third year. Increased funding has not kept pace with increased costs and is shared, this is, this is a result uh, hitting all of California, and it's a result of a lack of adequate funding and investment in public education that, that just should not be tolerated. And budget assumptions have changed, uh, and we'll talk more about those as we go through the presentation. So taking a look at the first area, the, the adopted budget in 2019-20, um, again, as it was shared by Trustee Stevens, all school districts are required to adopt three-year budgets, um, which is why we always look at our budget in three-year uh, increments. Um, as, you, as I mentioned, the adopted budget in June of 2019 had uh, deficits, and you can see the top red circle shows the deficit uh, that was projected for this year. And then also we had reserves at a minimum level in the third year, which is the bottom red circle. So there are reserves that are higher than the minimum in the next two years, but that third year um, shows that we are working to make the minimum with budget reductions. Um, our, our board has uh, a deliberate financial strategy um, to manage uh, the lack of funding and increase costs. And, and this has actually been played out, is working to spend down reserves during deficit spending to minimize any reductions, if any, that need to be made. And that's played out over the last several years. As the reserve has gone down, um, it comes a point where spending down the reserve is no longer of option that can continue to be used without budget reductions. And so the reserve is continuing to be projected to be spent down, but also in combination with budget reductions as well. And the recommendations that are being discussed tonight are really deliberate in not looking to have the impact of hoping for things to get better, which we all do and absolutely want them to be and want increased funding and, and, and a better investment in public education but not having us have to make 
large net mount, amounts of cuts in a single year, which could potentially result in lots of layoffs as well in a single year, but looking to make smaller cuts over a longer period of time to have less impact into, into our programs and hopefully less impact on employees. Um, and these um, recommendations, the alternative to waiting in a single year is to have actions that look like in, in neighboring districts. West Contra Costa County waited despite different factors and did 300 layoffs in the, a couple weeks ago. Sacramento City nearby uh, also has not adjusted their budget and, and did massive layoffs. And, and we see layoffs occurring in Huntington Beach, San Francisco, Kent Field and Marin County. Um, is district struggle to work through reserves, lack of adequate funding, and, and to balance budgets. So it's, it's something that we wish we weren't in this situation, but is not unique to Rockland Unified. Um, the second factor on how we got here is, as I mentioned, we've had increases in funding, and in, for example, the local control funding formula, or LCFF, as we love acronyms in education, um, when you look at, that's where most of our new revenue comes from. When you look at that new revenue plus enrollment growth, because we are predicting more enrollment just at a slower pace, we estimate that to be $3 million. However, again, it's not unique to us that increases in expenditures are outpacing uh, those increased in revenue. And for example, West Ed, a, a highly respected independent education research body, issued a report that we've linked on our, on our communications in April 2018 titled The Silent Recession, Why in California School Districts are, un are Underwater Despite Increasing Revenues. And so this is something that is, is plaguing school districts throughout the state um, and, and is not unique here. So let's go into these costs a little bit more. Special education costs, and if you can go to the next slide. Um, our special education costs, um, we are borne out in a few areas. First, we welcome the opportunity to serve students, uh, all of our students, and some of our students need more support than others. And, and that support often comes in increased staffing uh, to support those students, whether it be aides, whether it be behaviorists, school psychologists, teachers, and, and others. And so this chart shows that over a 12-year period, we've had an increase of 496 students uh, with special education. Um, it also shows that our costs of educating students uh, have gone from uh, nine point two million or nine point nine million to twenty seven million over that period of time. And another way to look at it is that there's been an increase in the increased cost of the average to the average student. Now we know each student has unique needs and each has unique IEPs that drives their services. But the dilemma with us with special education is we're having more students because we're doing a better job identifying and making sure they have their needs met but also we have more of those students and there's a, it's a more costly program to deliver for our students with special needs. There's also been some conversation that this has been driven by, by legal fees. And, and, and that um, just does not bear out. Uh, one point last year, which is the full, uh, full complete year, most recent year of 2018-19, 1.68% of our budget was legal fees in special education. So, so it's a small number, um, and, and, but we, you know, frankly, hate to spend any money on, on legal fees um, as well. So special education costs are predicted to go up by 1.2 million next year. Um, another factor is, is step and column costs, uh, net of retirement. And, and to explain this, step and column really is a contractual obligation that we have with our employees. And it works that as employees stay and provide another year of service to our, to our students, that we increase compensation each year as they, they commit to another year of service. It also rewards employees for becoming more expert in their field uh, as they attain more education. So this is something that is a positive. It rewards employees for staying with us. It rewards employees for increasing their expertise. And, and as a result, it allows employees to obtain annual uh, increases in compensation as they work with us. And this affects most of our employees. Of course, employees at the top of the salary schedule um, are, are not impacted by this, but most of our employees uh, do have that additional annual compensation. It's a contractual obligation that, that we, we, we think is important. And, and it is important because we all know, like in our households, in, 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 there are increases every year to, to the costs. 
Um, so we predict that to be 1.4 million. And then the other two factors are our pension costs. We're, we're mandated by the state of California to increase our contributions to the two state pension systems. Um, and for next year, for CalPERS, which is our uh, classified employees, that is predicted to be 650,000. And for CalSTRS, which is our teachers, administrators, and other certificated employees, 1 million above where we're at this year. So those four alone are $4.2 million in increased costs. And, and this does not include potential other expenses such as we haven't got our uh, property insurance rates yet. Those come in the spring and with all the recent wildfires, you know, you know those may increase or, or not. Um, but what it, we, the point of this is we just frankly, is, despite more revenue, it just doesn't keep pace with our, our expenses um, that we're required to make and it just shows the lack of funding uh, for California public education to be at an adequate level. The, the third area of how we got here is budget assumptions uh, do change. And our, a budget has assumptions in it, just like a weather forecast. And as assumptions change, uh, you need to change and make adjustments. And, and this is what responsible organizations do, is they keep their head up, they take a look, they monitor assumptions, and they change them as needed. And we had three major assumptions change this year in our budget. Uh, first is slower enrollment growth. Uh, again, we are thrilled that more families, more children are being educated in Rockland Unified than in previous years. However, it is at a slower rate than anticipated, and this is not unique to Rockland Unified. Um, we did demogra demographic studies, and we brought this to the board at our public board meeting in December that showed that we are expecting less enrollment growth than previously thought. And in talking to other superintendents in South Placer, um, they also are, are looking and adjusting their enrollment projections downward as well for growth. Um, we also had lower average daily attendance uh, in the beginning of the school year to current, and so we made adjustments on that. Average daily attendance is a critical marker because it's, that's actually how we get funded. We don't get funded because students are enrolled. We get funded because they show up in classrooms. And then the third factor in our assumptions was the governor's budget proposal in January had a lower cost of living adjustment for school districts. We were all told to budget on a higher cost of living adjustment. We all built our adopted budgets in June on that higher number. And then when the governor came out, he cut the number, which meant that we had to anticipate less funding. And so given those adjustments, we've had to be thoughtful in being able to, how do we manage that current context? How do we be as thoughtful in moving forward? And frankly, looking to be as, as precise as we can in the re reductions being recommended versus looking to overstate or understate them. And, and to discuss more of these assumptions in a little bit more detail is Deputy Superintendent Barbara Patterson. Good evening, President Stevens, Board of Trustees, Superintendent Stott. Uh, this uh, this is a, a slide to show the changes in the budget assumptions on the local control uh, funding formula. The district receives about 85% of its funding through this uh, funding formula. And um, this shows the, the, assum the budget assumption changes since adopted budget. So the second column shows you the COLAs that we were given from the Department, State Department of Finance. Um, at adopted budget and the dollar amounts that it generated based on our <coughs> enrollment projections at the time of 154 in 1920, 125 in 2021 and 21, 22, and then 50 in 22, 23. The next column shows you uh, the impact of a decrease in enrollment projections. So when we started school, we didn't get 154. It was um, more like 75. And so that resulted in a decrease of about $480,000 in the local control funding formula. We also, if you recall, we did a um, presentation to you about enrollment projections back in December uh, at the December meeting, um, adjusting the enrollment projection in 2021 from 125 down to 84, and then also adjusting 21-22 from 125 to 75 and leaving 22-23 at 50. And so as you can see in this 
um, column the effect on the local control funding by reducing the enrollment projections as well. Um, 852,000 in 2021 20, and so on down to 22, 23. The next column shows you another adjustment where we, as um, Superintendent Stock stated, the COLAs that came in the governor's proposed budget in January reduced our projected COLAs for years 2021 through 22, 23, the largest being next year from 3% down to 2.29%. That resulted in a decrease of funding of $758,000 and as you can see, another 878 in the next year, 1.3 million in the third year. And then finally, um, we review our projected ADA based on our enrollment, <coughs> and uh, we report attendance three times a year. P1 is for attendance through, uh, through December, uh, based on our, our school day calendar, and P2 is through March, and then a P annual. And we're funded through this formula based on the P2 report through March. And so every year after we complete the P1 report in January, we do a trend analysis and look at our um, difference from P1 to P2 in prior years compared to where we're at at P1 in the current year and compared to our budget. And based on that analysis, we determined that we needed to reduce our uh, projection for this year's ADA by 30. That results in a decrease of $288,000 this year, and then that cascades through all three of the years, as you can see. And then the, the blue column at the end is just a cumulative amount by year of the impact of these changes in our budget assumptions in the LCFF funding formula. Starting with this year, it's been a de decrease of $768,000 down to $3 million in um, lower revenues uh, in 22-23. So, uh, wide budget reductions. Um, with only minimally required state budget reserves in the third year, increased costs that outpace increased funding and changing budget assumptions, the only option available is to make budget reductions by reducing spending. And so, based on our current budget assumptions, and if the one-time uh, proposed, the proposed one-time reductions and delays are implemented, an additional 3.1 million of ongoing budget reductions are needed in 2021 to maintain the minimum, minimum state required reserve of 3% um, reserve for economic uncertainty in the third year out of 22-23. So this next slide, um, shows by example that the earlier you make reductions, the fewer cuts that you have to make. For instance, if you need $12 million less in expenditures by the third year, by making $4 million of ongoing budget reductions in year one, you will achieve those savings each year for three years. If you wait until the second year to make budget reductions, maybe hoping that assumptions will change for the better and they do not, you would need to make an additional $1,450,000 in budget reductions in year two, cutting deeper into programs, and an additional $1,028,000 in year three to achieve the same goal. So in this example, option two requires almost $2.5 million more in program cuts than if you were to make the reduction in year one. So the, the board mentioned earlier in, in, in its commentary was that the reductions actually started last year. This is not the first year of, of you spending down reserves and making budget reductions to reset our, our priorities. And so the, these reductions that were approved by the, by the board last year remain in effect and they're ongoing. The, these are not budget recommendations that, that had stopped. And, and these recommendations, as I shared, just as the ones this year were, were equally difficult to make um, because we know they had impact on individuals um, that, that contribute and work hard in our, in our system and it and, and also means there's less support and services at our schools. Um, in this next slide shows that some of these reductions, um, you know, wanted to just outline them. We followed the direction of the board 
to keep reductions as far away from the classroom as possible. And, and this was also shared by input from our community. So the reductions that were approved last year did not eliminate any positions in our classrooms. They eliminated six administrative and district office positions. Um, they eliminated programs that were we did not want to work on progr in limiting programs, providing direct -to services, services to students, and they really focused on support services, as you can see those listed there. And, and so, again, th none of these reductions w were easy to make, and, and, but this is not the first year of reductions. It is actually uh, going into our, uh, another year of reductions. So to talk a little bit more about these reductions and these adjustments that were made, lots of paper, is these weren't just developed in a, in a sudden position. These, um, the budget, I want to just spend a, a few minutes on the budget development process and some stakeholder input. And again, as shared by Trustee Stevens, uh, the budget development process uh, begins in January when the governor makes a budget proposal. We, we look to that and we always are hopeful that the, the governor in his proposal to the legislature will increase funding for public education because it's woefully underfunded. Um, and then going into that, we then work to gather input um, from cabinet district leadership team, includes principals as well, as, as they work directly to support uh, the learning at schools. And, and had a conversation with the board um, in our study session, which, is, which is, a, is a public open meeting, and then also in February about, about the budget. And then we had a tremendous feedback. I know I listed here in this slide 467 as of February 28th. This morning it was up to 518. Um, and, and that is one of the strengths of our community is we have, uh, do have a tremendously engaged uh, com community. Um, this is just part of the process tonight where we do ask the board to make preliminary decisions uh, in the budget process. These decisions in requesting approval of recommendations uh, to, to cut spending are necessary because it gives staff the direction to prepare the budget as we go through the process. Without this direction tonight, it would be not possible for us to develop the budget is we need to on time. Another key factor in why we asked the board to make these decisions tonight is that we are unfortunately recommending preliminary layoff notices be issued as part of these reductions. It would be unthinkable to ask the board to make that type of decision impacting employees without looking at a whole context of reductions, which is why we bring all the recommendations here tonight. Um, the state law requires that we issue any preliminary layoff notices to certificated employees by March 15th. If we fail to do so, then that fails to be an option for the district uh, to use in looking at its budget and if it needs to reduce spending. These notices are not final until May, um, but they are preliminary and they're required to be acted on at this time. It is the hope that any of the notices that, that would be issued if the board approves that tonight could hopefully be rescinded as retirements, resignations, or even additional funding may, may come in uh, in the process. Um, and then as the process continues, there are sig several more board meetings um, where discussions of the budget, the LCAP, are, are brought forward um, and opportunities for input. And then a, a whole other process of our local control accountability plan, the LCAP was mentioned quite a bit tonight. There's a whole other advisory process and that kicked off with uh, family community members l last week, um, st staff input uh, this week, and it continues that cycle as well. So we are at a certain point in the process. This is not the end of the process and there's lots of opportunities for input as we move through it. And But based on that input and, and, and looking at this, um, there were changes made uh, at board direction and as we heard from the community in our board meeting February 11th and our online portal, the board did give direction um, to st staff and myself to look to find other reductions, other ways to um, restore our elementary fifth, sixth grade music program. Um, that recommendation has been removed from the list before the board this evening, um, and, and that was done by identifying other budget reductions. It is, was discussed, 
Um, the elimination of freshman sports coaching stipends, that still is a reduction from the district budget, but I do need to credit the Rockland and Whitney High School athletic departments, the administrations, for in, in conversation that we had with them of looking at how to restructure a voluntary athletic contribution that Trustee Counter mentioned to, uh, to allow ninth grade sports to continue uninterrupted. And again, that is a wonderful thing about our community coming together. And so while this is modified in the sense that those will continue through the VAC being adjusted, uh, it, it still is a, is a reduction from the district budget. And then and the third adjustment is uh, not removing the uh, elimination of 2.0 FTE custodian positions. These were positions that um, the Rockland uh, Academy was ending funding for, planning to end funding for, which meant they would be absorbed back into our district custodial staff. But without the funding, it would need to be uh, uh, considered as a layoff recommendation to the board. Staff worked hard with Rockland Academy and engaged in conversations since February 11th, and it was able to uh, have Rockland Academy agree to want to employ two of our custodians to clean the facilities uh, that they uh, use at the Rukula campus. So we, we are, are grateful to be able to restore those, those two positions that were considered for potential layoffs. However, there were additional budget reduction recommendations, and again, these affect people directly, uh, and these are never, never easy to recommend. Um, so there are two additional budget recommendations. First is the elimination of the 0.75 FTE communications technician. Um, th the impact is that we end up with one person working in communications and community engagement, and, and this is, is uh, uh, one will be adjusting to because as there's more and more call for communication and engagement, we're reducing our capacity, but, but it's a necessary reduction uh, given the, the stances we're in. And then it's the elimination of a .5 FTE middle school assistant principal at Springview, and, and, and that is an additional reduction. Um, these again uh, worked hard to m not make reduc additional reductions uh, in, in classrooms, um, but, but to impact personnel other where in administration and district office. And, and to explain a little bit more about some questions the board had related to some of the reductions being recommended to the board is uh, Dr. Kathy Pond, our Deputy Superintendent of Education Services. Good evening. <clears throat> so these three questions were um, asked at our last meeting. Um, and the first has to do with what was um, what has been the effectiveness of our elementary summer school program. And I just want to uh, qualify that this is a reminder that our summer school is not being recommended for elimination for special ed students who qualify for extended year, uh, for economically disadvantaged kindergartners, or for juniors at risk for not graduating due to credit deficiencies. Um, we've done considerable research into the effectiveness of summer schools and intervention. Many studies show that summer programs, including at-home reading programs, can have positive effects with regard to slowing the learning loss during the summer, particularly for low-income students. Studies tend to show that summer learning gains have higher effects in, in mathematics uh, than reading, but these differences are <coughs> relatively small. However, all summer learning programs do not guarantee positive achievement for participants. Factors of regular attendance, uh, professional development for staff, rigorous programming, and duration or length of the program itself are variables that affect student success. Although we had put pre and post assessment scores that indicate students in our past summer programs have demonstrated gains in their summer curricula offered, our cohort of English learners has been too small to conduct a paired sample t-test to determine if the CAS scores from one year to the next show statistical, statistically significant gains. We will conduct can, that test for students. I'm sorry, can I interrupt? Yes. So I, I don't understand, what data are you looking at to make that determination? So are you looking at CAS, so you're sort of looking at the kids who were in summer school or not in summer school and seeing if a CAS score went up more? Based we, on we have our, our um, you know, our pre and post uh, based on the curriculum itself. So there is a pre and post assessment. Yeah, in, in yeah we have so you're, so you're looking at that to judge whether the effectiveness of the program over the time. We, we, 
you know, we saw multiple, gains multiple from their pre and post um, assessments on di different literacy skills. Yeah. Um, but we wanted to see long-term gains and, you know, um, as a cohort. So, you know, as you're seeing it happen in the summer school, but you want to see whether it maintains through the Correct. year, and you're saying when you look at the SBAC at the end of the year, it doesn't yes. seem to have maintained throughout now, the whole year. Now, we had only, we had less than 32 uh, English learner students in that summer school cohort, yeah. and, and statistically, yeah. you really should have 30 students. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and many of those students don't take the CAS test because they're primary students. And, and is it, do, do those lack of, does lack of maintenance of the gains go across all all, all subgroups. So we, for all kids in our summer school program, four ELs for our socioeconomic disadvantage, for our special, do you see that or is there a difference by subgroup? For last year, we, in the ELs and the Title I students that were in that program, we saw gains in the pre and post. Right, Not, but, we, the, but we haven't measured the. Oh, the against the SBAC. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, we do want to conduct that once the kids take the, for the grades three through six, the students who are in grades three through six conduct a. Um, a test uh, at the end of this spring when we get the CAS test. Um, likewise, I do want to point out that we had a small cohort of jumpstart math students who were in eighth grade entering into ninth grade, where we provided students um, who were performing near standard. Um, and they did show a slight advantage over similar students who didn't take the summer school program when we looked at fall grades in ninth grade. However, the, again, this cohort is very small and too small of a sample size to conduct a, um, a statistical, you know, pair T sample test. Um, I do want to say there is research, and some of it's actually from first five programs and districts, that um, suggests that kinder summer programs can have some positive effects for students in readiness, um, especially with regard to students' social skills, positive behavior, and increased engagement in kindergarten. The longitudinal effects of kindergarten programs alone on student reading readiness is not as clear, and we might consider um, what other kinds of early learning programs and strategies might best support reading readiness. The recommendation, I think this is the, the, the crux, to cut summer school for English learners and socioeconomically disadvantaged students was made to use this opportunity to create a different kind of summer support for pro, uh, program for students. The advisory groups in LCAP process are going to look carefully at needs and they've been doing that. And they may recommend other types of intense language literacy or numeracy pro experiences that could be offered to students instead of what many of us uh, envision as a traditional summer school, which is typically heavy in support staff and operating expenses. So that's the, the summer school question. Uh, the English learner program uh, staffing modifications and, and the impact. Um, the re re uh, sorry start over. The recommendation to reduce our current teachers of English language learners by 2.3 positions is part of an overall effort to increase the efficiency and effectiveness of our current English learner instructional, instructional delivery model. The reduction eliminates um, temporary positions and reduces staff at some sites where they're over ratio. The district has revised its English learner master plan and instructional delivery model to ensure that all teachers, that's regular classroom teachers um, of English learners are provided training skills and um, knowledge to become effective teachers of English language development, or ELD. Um, training has begun and will be continue to support all students in, of ELs to ensure that they know how to support language development through integrated English language development in our um, adopted benchmark and springboard language arts curricula through the designated uh, English language development through our um, pull-out ELD that targets students' different proficiency levels, and in supporting the acquisition of language across all content areas. The current model will be reorganized in remaining certificated teachers and paraprofessionals to, su um, to support designated pull-out ELD and continue to classroom teachers' use of ELD and language arts, and to increase EL's uh, English learner students' access to core curricula. Um, EL staff continue to uh, lead state mandated testing, monitoring of um, reclassified students, um, the actual reclassification itself, ELAC meetings, and work with newcomers and who are students um, at beginning stages of language development. The imp uh, what impact will reducing the instructional coaches have? Instructional coaching support is a hallmark of a progressive and cutting edge district and um, that has put structures in place to support high levels of teaching and learning. And we have demonstrated their impact on the system uh, in our past annual professional development reports. Last May, we reported to the board that coaches had supported district professional learning in student data analysis, technology, English language arts, 
Universal Design for Learning, Mathematics, History, Social Studies, and Behavior Support. Teachers ranking their possession, um, presentations, and we looked at all the surveys, um, uh, ranked them highest in re relevance, uh, 3.77 out of a uh, total of four, and in opportunities to acquire more information and skills. Their impact directly on student uh, achievement is a little bit more difficult to measure. Um, Students in the district have demonstrated small growth in ELA and mathematics, as we know. We argue, though, given the significant shifts of Common Core and the work to implement several new adoptions in the last few years, we may have seen achievement dip had not coaches been the boots on the ground supporting curricular and instructional needs. Our instructional coaches have been resource providers, data coaches, instructional and curricular specialists, learning facilitators, teacher leaders, and catalysts for change and continuous improvement. I, I will say reducing coaches will be a step backwards for the district as tendencies of learning organizations tend to slide back to status quo, and that's been well documented by Sengde in 2006 without levers in the system. However, we are committed to working with our professional learning committee and administrators in RTPA to identify a model of teacher leaders who can be empowered to grow this good work that uh, supports excellence in teaching and high levels of growth for adults and ultimately student achievement. Okay. Okay. So the next few slides are recommendations uh, that have been revised for budget reductions. So this slide uh, it, it shows the reassignment of 5.1 instructional coaches to the classroom, a reduction of the assistant principal at Sunset Ranch due to by 0.5 due to lower student numbers and staffing ratios and a reduction of the 2.3 Yale teacher positions, reflecting the elimination of temporary positions and staff were there over ratio. These reductions include the um, elimination of a district clerk position, reduction of a 0.5 custodian at Sunset Ranch due to staffing ratios, and the reduction of a custodian at the elementary level. It calls for the use of redevelopment agency restricted funds to contribute to the district's routine uh, restricted maintenance account, which will uh, limit the number of summer maintenance projects and, um, and the elimination of the, uh, elementary summer school in its current form. Next, this slide reflects uh, many reductions in site budgets and the reorganization of the current computer tech support at the elementary sites and at the middle school. These reductions um, include the savings in reorganization of the Rockland Independent Charter Academy that was approved last month, the reduction of library aids at the high school, uh, which will impact how the library techs currently interface with students during school hours. It also includes cuts to district office, department budgets, and online digital license, and reductions to discretionary, discretionary supply budgets for special ed staff. Next, the elimination of the work experience program is recommended along with the need for high schools to identify alternatives for students to earn credit for that work experience. The elimination of an extra period that's not populated with students um, for the district to monitor the current wave, channel, uh, excuse me, wave cable channel. The elimination of district music and VAPA equipment funds. The uh, institution of the Voluntary Athletic Contribution, or back to freshman for sports, and the reduction of district librarians from two to one. And finally, there are recommendations to eliminate the district communication tech position and um, half of a middle school AP at Springview Middle School due to lower numbers and staffing ratios. One time budget reductions include sweeping district professional development funds, delaying the opening of the new elementary site by a year, and transferring those one-time set-aside funds for funding administrative staff that would open the school, um, reducing the science adoption by purchasing modules in upper grades and delaying the K-4, um, and deferring mathematics adoption by one year to 2023 um, using one-time uh, mandated costs. So this graph, a little hard to see, um, this graph shows the impact of those reductions in terms of dollar amount from high to low. 
with using the dist uh, with the, at the top you see the district's restricted maintenance account contribution and instructional coaches at the um, there at the top and those are supply budgets at the bottom. And again, not considered but recommended, excuse me, considered but not recommended at this time are the sweeping of site discretionary funds, mental health services, canceling our online platform Schoology, and increasing classes in um, all grade levels, including ninth grade uh, mathematics and English language arts, um, eliminating the academy model and the middle school athletic stipends. So is we are in the budget process, as I shared earlier in our previous slide, that we're in, in a portion of the process. This tonight is not the end of the process. There are many unknowns that remain in our budget, and, and we hope that they turn more positive. But the budget unknowns that we have are the new proposal around special education funding and expenditures. Um, we, we have estimates in our, on our expenditures as we share those anticipate going up. And then as far as the governor's new proposed funding for special education, uh, we, we did seek guidance from the county. We included a letter from the county superintendent of schools in our board packet. We received the letter yesterday and included it in the packet yesterday. But the county superintendent um, acknowledges that we, there is proposed funding for special education, which we welcome greatly, but it cautions us to not to be very careful in the use of this in our budget development. Is there, and I'm gonna read from the letter that's in the packet. We, how However, we strongly caution at this time it's only a proposal that may have many changes before the final budget is adopted by a legislature. The district should be prepared to submit a fiscal year 2020-21 budget that meets the minimum reserve requirement of 3% is required by AB 1200. The Placer County Office of Education may need to change Rockland's budget certification from positive to qualified or negative if additional revenues do not materialize prior to budget adoption and sufficient reductions are not made to meet minimum reserve requirements for fiscal year 2020 and 21 in two additional years. The, so as we welcome these funds, we have applied some of this new funding um, to not make a full recommendation. We've applied 300,000 uh, of hopeful of this new revenue to not make further recommendations and also use an additional approximately a little over 100,000 to work to restore the music uh, elementary music program. So we have been aggressive in using these funds that the county has cautioned us about using and we hope that it materializes. We hope this funding is fully completed when the uh, governor's budget is adopted and, and would welcome that. But, but we did want to acknowledge that we did get some additional information since February 11th related to these funds and, and wanted to share that with the board and the public. Um, we also don't owe our actual COLA. This is de as a federal number that is determined uh, usually in April and then the governor chooses how to apply it to the May revise budget. Uh, we're looking at our average daily attendance, P2ADA. Again, as we reminded, average daily attendance is how we get fund the majority of our funds. It's kids showing up. And so we're hopeful that increases, but with all the concerns around coronavirus, we just don't know. Um, and, and so we're looking forward to that. And that, con and that P2 period ends in March. Uh, we also are, are waiting to see our, our prop property and liability and workers' compensation insurance premiums. Again, as I mentioned, with the recent wildfires, we're unsure what those rates will be, and we get those in the spring. Uh, the governor will give us a May revised budget, and, and we, uh, again, are hopeful that he'll increase the COLA, increase funding uh, in the investment in public education. And, and then we also have retirements and resignations that typically come in during the spring. We, we hope that, um, you know, anyone that's making a decision to, uh, you know, retire uh, we, or to that they have other circumstances that they're resigning, that they, we know and we can rescind any preliminary layoff notices the board may approve tonight as quickly as possible. And then, frankly, we cannot wait till August 12th because that's when we start the next school year and we know, we'll know for sure what our enrollment will be. As we've shared a projection of, of increasing enrollment, um, we, we hope to validate that as school starts next year. And again, the other unknown just is, frankly, the impact of coronavirus. We hope it's minimal. We hope it's not um, widespread impact in our community and in education, but, but it is an unknown, and, and to not mention that uh, would just not be, be, be a current uh, factor. Uh, and then 
there's been some conversation around uh, collaboration and, and wanted to be the first to acknowledge, I acknowledge this in February, we'll acknowledge it tonight, that there has been a, a sincere and genuine effort to work in different ways to have better collaboration. Um, and that's a multitude of ways, safety, professional learning, special education, uh, and just on to go ongoing issues such as we've talked about uh, with, with, with the needs uh, going on in the district. And these are not perfect efforts. Um, they can definitely be improved and there is a sincere e effort to want to do so. so but in related to the budget, we, we are committed to want to continue to engage in dialogue, clarify aspects of the budget development process, uh, work, wanting to work collaboratively as we can and we're open to, to ideas and new ways of doing so to communicate the budget in reductions and impact to stakeholders. And we do acknowledge that there is a legal obligation to bargain the effects with our labor partners of any reductions the board were to approve uh, this evening or in the future as well. And then the next steps, um, again, we're, we are requesting the board do approve the revised budget recommendations um, and preliminary layoff notices associated with these recommendations. And, and again, these recommendations come at this time because if the board were to not take some action tonight to make these preliminary decisions, then it would not allow uh, staff to use any potential layoffs is a part of looking at that overall picture. And so it's unfortunate that the state requires March 15th preliminary notices, that it doesn't delay that as more information comes in the budget development process. This statute has been in place a long time and it was enormously frustrating when we had the Great Recession and it continues to be frustrating uh, to this day. We also will be making rec adjustments to our recommendations as the budget develops based on, on the input from community, which we anticipate to be considerable and we welcome in from the board. Um, we want to continue to try to collaborate, consult with our labor partners. And, and then again, we will be working to rescind layoff notices, adjust our budget as the governor updates his, and then uh, work to reconcile our budget um, as we, we get the state budget. Um, and, and, and again, this is something that um, we, um, I wish it was a different budget report and recommendations to the board, but it is uh, that reality facing California public education. And at this time, trustees, uh, we are uh, available to answer any questions the board may have regarding uh, this presentation or the recommendations contained. Great. Thank you, Mr. Superintendent. Appreciate the conversation. Appreciate the uh, presentation. Uh, so, um, colleagues, I think what I'm going to suggest is that we ask questions of uh, Kathy and Barbara and Roger as we have them. Um, then we can, um, after we ask our round of questions, we can open up for public comment. Then following public comment, we can make final comments if we have any based on what we've heard we feel uh, needs to be said. So with that, uh, let me open it up. Does anyone have any uh, questions for, uh, for the staff? Uh, Trustee Stevens. So I, I want to clarify, make sure I heard correctly. We don't have agreed special ed funding language at the state level yet. And the county's warning us it might not happen, but we are assuming that we will get $300,000, correct? Yes. Okay. That's correct. Um, I also just heard several weeks ago the president proposed the federal budget would slash federal funding for education. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like maybe that won't happen because Congress probably won't even pass a budget. But I know federal funding is not a big amount of money, but it's not nothing. Have we assumed in these projections any cuts to federal funding, or are we assuming it will stay level? We haven't assumed that yet. We're okay. um, talking to the state to kind of get an idea of how likely that is to happen before we do that. But it's not just the special ed IDA. It's all. It's Title I, Title II. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other? There? Just, we talked about slow enrollment growth. So we were projecting <coughs> what percent, and we actually came in at what percent? Uh, we were projecting 154. We got 75 this okay. year. So about half. Yes, about half. And so we're projecting 84 next year. We had originally projected 125 okay. for the next year, so we, we reduced those. Okay. 
Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we just had our kindergarten registration being did any Numbers surprises up. there? Numbers more are more or less. Dr. McDonald, uh, kindergarten <laughs> registration numbers are up slightly. Slightly. Mm -hmm. About 5% over last year. Okay. Thanks. And then in regard to the attendances we're talking about for Air 88, <coughs> when you take those projections, so the, the 85, the 75, et cetera, are we, seeing, are we seeing it at a specific grade? Are you seeing it at, like, is it, is it going up in high school and down in grade school? Is it going up in middle school and up in kindergarten? Like, our, our enrollment is growing more at the secondary level. So seven, eight, seven through twelve. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it's not growing at the K six. Right. Okay. Eric, do you have another question? Yeah. Sure. One more. This is. I, I think I have the answer. I think this is more clarification. Uh, a lot of people are concerned. There's a lot of conversation going on, not just with us, but on social media. Some information I see being shared is correct, some is not. One thing I think is incorrect, but I think is relatively easy to clear up. I've seen some talk on social media about the construction project at Rucola and comments along the lines of, well, you've got about a seven something million dollar budget deficit this year. If, you, if the board was not undertaking that construction project, that would be the seven something million dollars you need. But isn't it true that those construction dollars can only be used for construction or potentially modernization of facilities? Yes, that is correct. That's being funded with developer fees and Melarus taxes. So, um, and, and we're also hoping to um, get the reimbursement for the Granite Oaks expansion. So those are the three sources, and all of those have to be spent on facilities. They cannot be spent on operational costs. Right. Legally, legally, legally based on state law and based on the language in the ballot propositions that our voters approved many, many years ago, like it is against the law to use even a penny of that for any of the types of cuts we're talking about making tonight, correct? That's correct. Okay. Thank you. I just want to take just a second and clarify a little bit um, for the public the process that we receive as a board the budget the same day. It comes out the Friday before the board meeting and individually I have spent hours and I will assume the same for my colleagues. And I don't have a lot of questions tonight because I've spent hours talking to teachers. I was at a site again today talking about, hey, what if this is going to impact you? How? Why? I've spent a lot of time at the dis district office trying to figure out why did we choose this over something else? I said, hey, I'm seeing a lot on social media. I'm receiving phone calls and emails wanting people want to hear about this public process. It's in here, right? We're trying to listen to you. We want to hear and understand, and we ha are asking questions as well and invested in this, in this process. So, thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Oh, sorry. Yep, sorry. Just, one more. And just to clarify, so just from an overall process standpoint, and that we're in a, today is an approved, like we would vote to approve the process or approve the budget and then continue as things are plus or minus, as you get a May revised, as attendance, as those things changed, and we will adopt in June. Right? I, I believe you're not approving the budget, you're approving the reductions. Thank you. Thank you. Right, right. This, this really constitutes um, two things. One is guidance to staff and how to develop the budget for next year because there's a lot of work that goes into developing it and planning related to it um, because there are adjustments and, and there's even needs to negotiate any impacts with our, our labor partners and, and to give us time to do all that um, these preliminary uh, decisions are asked to be made by the board it also, uh, we're asking the board to approve these budget reduction recommendations uh, at this time because layoffs are, are a part of th that whole package. And, and we just think it would be irresponsible to not have the board see the whole host of recommendations when we would request potential layoffs as part of that. 
and because of, as I mentioned before, the law requires preliminary notices, even if there may be changes uh, prior to the final budget adoption. So, um, it, and this is something that happens throughout school districts in California, is they go to their <coughs> boards for sharing, here's our assumptions as we build the budget, we need input, we need approval uh, and guidance. So let me, uh, if I could build off that a little bit, I'm sorry, I'll let you, uh, uh, so, because I do know uh, that, there, that there's been a lot of questions uh, from RTPA tonight, and I know others will ask about this notion of delay, which I don't think we can do, so I want to say why I don't think we can do it, and that way we can have a public conversation about, about that. So I want to be very clear up front. So my understanding of the process is that by statute, if we are going to lay anybody off in our district, we have to let them know by May 15th. I'm sorry, March 15th, by March 15th. So if we do not send out a March 15th notice, we have no ability to lay anyone off. And the reality is, as we saw, the vast majority of our dollars are in our personnel. And that's where you're going to get big money. The reason we're having this joint conversation, even though these cuts don't, won't be adopted until the June, the reason we're having this conversation now is if we don't know where we're going to make cuts, we're forced then to lay off or, or send letters to as enough people to cover the entire $3 million deficit just to be on the safe side which is to be crystal clear, and I know we agree, is that if you, if you get a letter <coughs> saying you could be laid off, and then we rescind that letter, it doesn't change the impact of getting a letter saying you're gonna be laid off. It's horrible, it's a terrible process, and it's the last thing we wanna do. So my understanding is the reason we're here today in this conversation now is so we have clarity around where those cuts will come from so we don't have to over send letters home to teachers or other personnel to let them know that they may not come back. Exactly. The goal is to minimize the, uh, the impact on layoffs, but also uh, give the board that option. And so that's exactly why we okay. work to develop this whole proposal at this time, is to work to minimize layoffs to the extent possible. The preliminary notices, again, these are not final, and we hope at the end of the cycle that, that we don't have any. Okay. You, do you have? Oh, yeah. Yep, sorry. Yeah, uh, one more question. Uh, in terms of where we are in the LCAP process, have our LCAP advisory groups met since the budget reduction recommendations came out earlier in February? Has that they, happened in the last couple yes, of weeks? Yes, they met for the first okay. time last week and then our staff met this week. Okay. Was there any explicit conversation about some of the proposals around, for example, the 2.67 FTE EL? We really were looking at the okay. needs at this time. Um, there was a great question posed about, um, you know, if we're cutting things like summer school and LCAP advisory process is still going on, and hence my comment about, you know, we, we just need to not be so narrow to think about traditional summer school. We do need to continue to find ways to support, and we're called to do that through the LCAP process. Yeah. Well, this is now a comment, but it's probably agreed to by the board. I think regardless of what happens tonight, like we know we have not just a legal duty, but a moral imperative to make sure the LCAP dollars we're getting, the supplemental money, is being used in the most effective way possible to help English language learners and socioeconomically disadvantaged students and that that and foster youth and that is I know the focus of the LCAP groups and the LCAP development process but especially in times like these I think it is as a board member later in the spring when we get back results from LCAP I know I'm going to be looking very hard at the recommendations and asking, like, why do we think that works? Are we really using these supplemental dollars, we think, in the way that will have the biggest impact? Like, for example, maybe look at using some LCAP money for the summer school program for ELs. On the other hand, you explained tonight why we've got credible reason to think that was maybe not the best use of our funding to help ELs. But I think those are the types of questions we're going to have. That's, that's a further conversation we're definitely going to want to have later in this spring when LCAP comes back. Great. I have one more question, sorry. I, um, I visited the libraries. I, I understand the aid position, but can you give me a little more insight on the impact of losing one of our district librarians? Our, our district librarian, um, just a stellar in, um, 
instructional leader, and she has, um, besides bringing a lot of resources, um, most recently on diversity, and, and um, has also, she works uh, with the library techs at the elementary school um, so that they can execute lessons and, and, and resources for their staffs. And so, um, you know, obviously cutting a position will always be an impact, especially to the additional not to the additional, to the remaining district librarian. Thank you. Any other board questions? Okay, at this point we'd like to open up to public comment. I do want to say as people start queuing up, you're welcome to queue up, but I want to be clear, everyone that wants to speak will be heard, so if you want to stay seated and wait till the end and no one's in the queue, and then I will wait and make sure you can come forward so you don't feel you need to stand in line, but you're welcome to stand in line if you want that as well. So with that, we'll open up public comment. A reminder that you have three minutes. The, uh, the uh, clock is... Sorry, the clock is right here so you can see it. Um, and uh, we ask if, you, if you're willing to give us your name and your, uh, and your, and, what's that? It's for everything. Oh, right, uh, your name and your um, city. The other thing I wanted to say is that we have several agenda items on the agenda following this that are directly related to the budget conversation. So we're hoping to keep this as a single item, which is to say if you have something to say to those, we could just wrap into one, and then we will, uh, and then that way, the because the, it's the same, we just sort of are implementing what we're talking about in the budget item. So that's our hope and our plan uh, to go forward uh, after we get through this item. Uh, but with that, uh, we will open up for public comment. Thank you. Hi. Oh. Sorry, that was... <laughs> My name is Adrienne Pocklington. I am a Rockland resident and I am a parent to four children in this district. Uh, I've sat and listened for two plus two hours to information that essentially was repeated from the last meeting. Um, the consensus is we're scrambling. It's pushed together. We're doing this quickly. We're trying to avoid pink slips. The biggest thing you have not addressed, not one teacher has asked for these cuts over receiving a pink slip. Not one teacher has said, my emotional health and fear around receiving a pink slip is more important than my students and what they need. It hasn't been said because that's not how they feel. I understand the cost of charter has to be allocated for construction, but there's nothing to say that those costs couldn't go into finishing the elementary school, which would provide attendance, which would provide students and give actual funds to where our district needs. We are hoping to shift to a time where the board, the district, and the community works together. Because consistently in these last several meetings, it's chaos, it's anger, and there's just no unity. We need to be the calm. We need to work together and create cuts and budgets and teamwork that can leave everyone feeling heard and that they matter. I understand that you guys have rescinded on some of the recommendations for cuts, but the way that translates to your community is we are going to scare you. We are going to give you 20 cuts and then only actually cut 10 so we can make it seem less scary. The way that translates to us is just a constant guessing game of what is factual and what is perceived hysteria. So this year is funded. I understand next year is funded. It feels like we are jumping the gun to create cuts that aren't imperative at this moment. So I ask you for the following. Delay budget cuts until we can work together, until our community and our teachers and our board can work to find resolutions that work for everyone. Allow our teachers to be a part of this conversation because it's very frustrating as a parent to have you want to trust the lives, the education, the mental health, the day-to-day -day lives of my kids with these teachers, but they're not being trusted enough to be actively involved in these conversations with the board. And finally, allow for parents and stakeholders to engage. Allow us to be a part of the process. Town halls have worked well in other districts where you give us a voice to work together. Because if we work together, we can start to be the calm instead of just adding to the chaos. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. I'm gonna be honest. I don't think any of you have realized that this moment is not about a budget. It is about the lack of transparency. It is about the lack of accountability. It is about 
about a lack of working with the community and working with your teachers. It's not even about the budget. I suspect you're going to pass whatever is asked to, your staff has asked you to pass today. I am hearing nothing about how you will fix your communication issues. This, this happened last year. Nothing has been fixed. Personally, I have reached out to this board and offered to voluntarily help you set up a communication system with parents and teachers. None of you responded. I have sat with staff and said, I will come in. I will teach you how to utilize Facebook, build engagement. None of those meetings were set up. So you can explain that there wasn't time, but there is. This is my family's fifth school district. I have seen worse financial situations, six million dollars missing in another one. They communicated better than this. And that was before the Fed showed up. You guys released information last October that explained that you had deficit spending. So telling us that you couldn't talk about it or you didn't have any idea or the budget was all just now doesn't work. Bring the teachers in, you knew in October. Bring the parents in, have a conversation. Make it so that it's not us against you, it's all of us together working together for our students and our school community. Because until all the stakeholder voices are held in these conversations, you will not have a school that reflects your community. Thank you. My name is Nicole Bruce, resident of Rockland. Um, I wasn't planning on speaking tonight at all, but I felt compelled to write this while in the audience tonight, while looking at the numbers that you all are presenting. It's pretty obvious that you have already made your decisions regarding these budget cuts and what you're going to do. But I just want you to understand the impact of these cuts. I'm going to be speaking specifically on the behalf of the cuts to our ELD program. I'm not even going to touch on to what Dr. Pond said regarding EL students in summer school and what Mr. Stevens said regarding LCAP results because test scores aren't everything. We are told repeatedly during professional development sessions and through our own research that our three groups of students with the greatest academic <coughs> needs are special education students, students with um, their socio socioeconomically disadvantaged, and English language students, English language learner students. This is true. But how are we supposed to meet the needs of one of our populations that are in greatest need, the EL students, if you're gonna cut any of our ELD teachers? I don't really know if you get the impact of what this is going to do in the real world, in our classrooms. I had a student in a previous year that had been in the United States for a few short months before school started. He was from South Korea. His alphabet was completely different from ours. I teach fifth grade. I'm supposed to teach students how to multiply and divide fractions in word problems. I'm supposed to teach students how to format a research-based five-paragraph formal essay. How can I do this if my student can't even ask me, may I use the restroom? Our ELD teachers provide a vital resource that I don't think you understand. Our students need this. The students that are already scared and floundering in a new country and with a new language and all new people, please don't cut these people. These ELD teachers, our students need this. And going forward, just again, what people said, please be more transparent. We've known about this, you've known about this, we've known about this. Don't talk about it a month before it needs to happen. Members of the board, members of the community, teachers, students. My name is Charles Phillips. My family and I live in the Whitney Ranch uh, neighborhood. I have two kids that attend schools in the district. Uh, we're here at this meeting because the board states that we have a budget crisis. 
the main item I would like to touch on this evening is accountability. As a former director for a publicly traded Fortune 500 company, I know that being financially accountable to a knowledgeable board of directors is an extremely important task, as well as holding people accountable for their own actions or inactions. We all know that the superintendent is like the CEO of the school district, and the board, this board, oversees not only the superintendent's duties and outcomes, but the outcomes of the district as a whole. So let's talk about Roger Stock for a minute. What I find upsetting is the fact that from 2014 through his contract renewal in 2019, trustees Maben, Miller, Stevens, and Counter unanimously voted yes to approve Mr. Stock's outrageous and unwarranted pay increase without any parent or community input. From 2014 through 2019, Mr. Stock's annual pay increase has gone up by 41%. What have our kids gotten in return for that 41%? Classroom size reduction, upgraded facilities, school psychologists, science and math equipment, art supplies. The questions go on and on, and the answers are all no. But Mr. Stock gets paid just over $263,000 per year all because this board approved it. This board extended his contract. This board has gone rogue without parent and teacher involvement and it needs to stop. I've said it to this board before, spirited debate is a good thing. If you don't agree on something, that's okay. Talk about it. When it comes to the budget, the board doesn't need to understand the line items However, you need to have the courage to ask questions, which you all did just now, and challenge the superintendent about budgets that are, not, that are put before you. If he does not know the answer, then he's not the right person for the job. If you don't agree with something, then have the courage to vote no. Time and time again, this board has voted to approve every single budget that has come up for a vote. Time and time again, this board has passed the budget unanimously. This even occurred on trustee Price's very first day as a member of the board back in September. If two plus two does not equal four, then do not approve the budget. Send it back for further review. Get involvement from the community. Thank you, sir. Three minutes are out. Thank you. Hello everyone, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you tonight. My name is Kelly Schultz, I live in Rockland and I'm a library aide at Rockland High School. I have been with the district for 15 years. And I'm Diana Stokes and I've been with the district for 10 years and I'm also a library aide at Rockland High School. I'm here to give you a snapshot of my job and hit you with some numbers, like you haven't been hit with enough numbers tonight. Since August, the beginning of the current school year, we at Rockland High School have checked out 12,831 textbooks and 2,658 library books. We currently serve a student body population of 2,138 students. In the last 34 school days alone at Rockland High School, we have had 43 classes use the library floor for research projects, utilizing our books and Chromebooks. We have had 76 classes come through to check out textbooks for each individual student, sometimes three to four classes per block. In the same 34 school days, we have had 203 students on passes from class for printing, computer issues, book checkouts, etc. On any given day, we have 80 to 100 students in the library during plus period and lunch. One classified employee covering the library floor, the counter, assisting students with printing and computer questions, and Chromebook management is truly unrealistic. This is prime for a possible compliance and safety issue. The end of the school year is coming up. That is truly our busiest time. That is the return of all library books, textbooks, teachers' class sets, as well as clearing fines from students' accounts, and assessing any damage to books and possibly repairing those books. 
While it varies per student and grade, each student <coughs> has an average of four books checked out. That means we will collect upwards of 15,000 books, typically just during the last couple days or week of school in June. They also all need to be put away. We can't just leave them on carts. In addition to all the numbers I gave you, there are many instances during the day that I don't have stats for, like unlocking a student's computer account, resetting a password, helping a student laminate something for a teacher, and helping with many printing issues and questions that arise on any given day. I understand all about budget cuts. My library aid salary will make a very small impact on the overall budget if it is cut, but the impact of losing all the support I provide to students and staff alike will be very large. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Karen. I'm the library aide at Whitney High School. I've worked for Rockland for school district for 15 years. I'm here to express my concern for the recommended budget reduction cuts and eliminate the entire staff of our four library aide positions between Rockland and Whitney High School. The elimination of the library aide position will impact the entire school community. Having one library tech trying to efficiently support the needs of our entire school population of over 2,000 students and over 90 staff members will be difficult to manage. The result of the budget cut with libraries will be seen and felt with the students and staff. The library and library aides support all departments in the school, including ASB activities, topics, counseling topics such as mental health awareness, AP testing, broadcasting, social studies projects, numerous English research projects, novels, and activities. The reduction will affect material accessibility to reach students and teachers in a timely manner. Textbooks, novels, Chromebooks, logging into school accounts, computers, troubleshooting, research materials, circulation, <coughs> inventory, class sets, just a small example of what we would do in a day. The library is the hub of our school community and academic institution. Let's keep it strong. Extensive research has proven that a school library with appropriate staffing makes a positive impact on a student's overall academic achievement and success. Having an experienced library staff that will support both students and staff with the goal of assessing and preparing the students and having access to materials will help them to be successful with their high school work and also preparing them for future higher education and job market skills. Since the beginning of 2019 school year, Whitney Library has circulated and checked out 2,200 Chromebooks, 1,400 library books, 11,000 textbooks, in addition processing 2,100 new books assisted with over 1,700 student printer usages. With the amount of assets being checked in and out of our school library inventory, accountability and accuracy is critical. One person processing this volume of materials will be overwhelming and time consuming. The space of a library also provides more than just books. The school library provides a safe haven for many students to come and use the library space to think, create, plan, gather in small groups, study discussions, to help develop communication and interpersonal skills, to meet with friends and feel that they matter and that they have a place, that they belong on campus. Students can get homework help, prepare for tests, work on class and homework assignments to complete prior to participating in their after-school sports or having an after-school job. Before school and during lunch, the Whitney Library has an average of over 120 students using that space. You are proposing that one library tech will be able to manage the library counter, job responsibilities, and supervise this amount of students. I question if this amount of student traffic will be in supervision, supervision compliance and within safety regulations. Strong school libraries build strong students. I urge you to reconsider the reduction of the library aides that support our Rockland students. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Michelle Linder and I'm the library tech at Rockland High School. I have worked in the RHS library for 20 years and I've been a Rockland resident for the past 28 years. <laughs> um, as you've heard from Kelly and Carrie, our libraries are used quite heavily. Um, looking at your board document, you state that eliminating part-time library aid positions 
could possibly limit the hours that we are open to students. It will definitely limit those hours. Having one person overseeing the entire library, the library techs need to take lunch. I guess we close for lunch. We have meetings. Well, I guess we close. Um, maybe a little too much information and embarrassing, but hey, Rockland High School does not have a bathroom in the library. So a simple bathroom break is now a big issue. Do I clear the library and say, sorry, I have to go to the bathroom? I mean, I hope I don't have to do that. That's a little too much information I want to share with my students. But anyways, just to know that our students matter to us, and we wear so many hats in the library. We're the librarians. We are computer techs. We don't have computer techs in the library. When there's printing, uh, computer problems, we're troubleshooting that. Um, we can be counselors at times. We have students come in, you know, they feel safe there. They've had a bad day. They want to talk. We're there for them. And we are more than happy to listen. We sometimes are just moms. We have students come in that are upset. They've had a loss or personal matter. And we're there for them. We offer a kind word and some compassion. We build relationships with our students. So don't take that away. And to the second impact, which is so <coughs> false, <coughs> is saying that a full-time library tech will regularly not have to regularly interface with our students. We do that, the library techs. That is a big part of our jobs on a day-to-day -day basis. I work very closely with my aides. We are a team, and it takes two of us in order to check out, like Kelly had stated, 12,831 textbooks. That is two of us working together. So we are a busy place. We need our support. To take the support away from library techs, it's, it's going to be a huge negative impact for our students and our staff alike. So cutting 100% of aid time means that the library techs will have to support an entire high school's needs for teacher support textbooks, novels for language arts, Chromebook management, free reading, student interaction, supervision. This is unrealistic. As library techs, we have other responsibilities. We have to place all the orders in the library. We do all the library book orders. That is time consuming, because we are reading thousands of book reviews, because we want the best young adult literature available. Michelle, I'm sorry, but three minutes up, can okay. you wrap it up? Thank you, I appreciate your time. I just hope you will uh, Take Thank the information you. to heart, what we've provided for you tonight, and reconsider those cuts. Thank you. Thank you. We're not all going to speak. <laughs> we might sing something. <laughs> Um, so I'm just going to read you a letter that we've all approved. Um, I, my name is Jeremiah Jacks. I am the president of this newly founded Placer County Music Educators Association. I had the privilege to teach music at Springview Middle School for three years. I currently teach music for Loomis Unified School District, and I'm in my 21st year as a music educator. I am also a Rockland resident, a stepfather of four children, currently all enrolled in the Rockland Unified School District. Over the years, we have seen music and art programs threatened when budgets get tight. Music is vital to our children's education and their futures. Rockland is a wonderful community, and we all expect a strong and thorough education for our children. We greatly appreciate the RUSD Board of Trustees' decision to keep music <laughs> education from the list of cuts to our children's public education. We are also advocating for public music education at the state capitol. I have recently written the governor and am on the CMEA State Council organizing another advocacy event on March 24th. PCMEA will be more involved also with this advocacy event in the future. Placer County Music Educators Association hopes 
Rockland Unified School District will not recommend music education to be considered in their budget cuts in the future. We strongly believe that no subject should be removed from a child's education. And again, we appreciate that the Board of Trustees have removed the recommendation from their consideration this year. Thank you. I'll be brief. Uh, Tom Douglas, Rockland High School. And uh, I do want to invite all of you uh, to March is designated as Music in Our Schools Month uh, by the National Association for Music Education. And we celebrate that by having district music festivals. So uh, I would love to have you all join us. And I know quite a few have in the past. And over the next three Tuesdays, we will have hundreds of students performing. That all started, uh, majority, started in education, in music, in the fifth grade. So as you see them in the secondary schools, you can see what that start provides them. So here are some flyers for you. Thanks, Tom. Hi, I'm Jordan Meissen. I'm in sixth grade and I go to Cobblestone Elementary. First of all, let me say it is a pleasure being here to talk with you about the budget cuts. Second, I think these ideas to cut arts and parts of library are outrageous. It has always been exciting for me to go to the library. I love to read and our librarian, Mrs. Daniels, is amazing. She goes above and beyond to make our library a wonderful, stunning place to be. Even though my fellow sixth graders and I are the oldest kids on campus, she still reads picture books to us and let, lets us feel older yet loved at the same time. When we check out books, she asks us about our day and creates flexible seating in the library, such as benches like in a park or beanbags. How would you feel if your child is going to school without this opportunity? I also think cutting VAPA is just wrong. For starters, I moved up when I, before I moved up here from Orange County, I had no art or VAPA. I repeat, none. The only art we got was in our class or an after-school art club. I enjoy going to VAPA, and even though I'm not an artist, but it still allows me to be creative. And also when I go to this school next year, or any kid who's going to middle school in a few years, might not be able to take art as elective. VAPA also allows kids to be creative and use art materials that they may not be able to use at home or anywhere else. I'm also going to speak for my seven-year-old sister, <coughs> and she told me to say that she loves VAPA because she can use art materials that she's unable to use at our house. She feels relaxed and happy when she's at art. How would you feel if your child becomes stressed or moody at home because art is taken away from them at school? Some kids feel accepted or at home in these places, so I think I proved my point of not banning library or VAPA. I hear from parents, books, teachers, occasionally peers, that actions speak louder than words. But why isn't the school boarding setting an example of doing that? Thank you for listening. Thank you. Hello, I'm Abigail Root, a junior at Whitney High School who lives in Roseville, but is a transfer student to this district. And I'm here today not because I want to be, but because I have to be. I feel a strong obligation to be here to advocate for myself, for my peers, and for my teachers who are some of the most hardworking people who you continue to take advantage of. My moral compass has led me here today to serve those you were sworn to serve. I should not have to be your personal Jiminy Cricket, but I am and will continue to be until you finally listen to the voices of compassion and reason, voices we have heard thus far and will continue to hear from tonight. I probably wouldn't be here if you were all taking the hit as well, but seeing as Roger Stock has been asked in the past not to take his exorbitant automatic annual raise and has continued to decline, I am here, representing all students from my district. But today, you are really, you are really only deciding on cuts that will hurt some. Some students will be inconvenienced, but many will be devastated. Tonight, you will not decide if all students have access to music equipment, to the English language, or to sports. You will decide if socioeconomically disadvantaged and marginalized students will. Privileged students may have to drive to a local soccer club, buy their own instruments, or wait for an English tutor to swing by their house, but they will still have access to these crucial pieces of development. However, low-income students will not. 
Our district looks fantastic from the outside, and our data is immaculate. Well, immaculately tailored, seeing as you send any student who will fail high school to victory to keep your graduation rate impeccable. But once you take a closer look, which I honestly hope you haven't, given what you are considering, the facade, cr the facade crumbles. Our overall data looks great because most of our students are decently well off. They're white, middle-class students, but our marginalized students, well, that's an entirely different case. Students who are not white are far less likely to do well on the PSAT when compared to their peers. Students who are experiencing homelessness have the highest rates of chronic absence and failing grades. Within the last year, the chances of a student who is disabled, Hispanic, Asian, or socioeconomically disadvantaged being suspended increased by a large margin. These students have taken enough of a beating from this district, so how dare you threaten to disadvantage them more? At the last, boarding, at the last board meeting, um, at the last board meeting, I said that I meet with these students daily. I am the one who has to deal with the consequences of your actions. Until you stop threatening these students while lining your pockets, I will be here. Until you sit in my cramped office space every day and meet with these students who are playing God with, I will be here. Until you finally deal with the consequences of your actions, I will be here. Last time, I asked you to think of a disadvantaged student or even myself if you need a reason to vote against these cuts. Today, I will ask you to do something a little easier and think of yourselves. You are elected officials, and we will, be forced to, you, we will be a force to be reckoned with until you deal with the consequences of your actions or you are out of a job. Good evening, Board of Trustees and Superintendent Stock. My name is Emily Buck. I am a resident of Rockland, a registered voter, but most importantly, to hundreds of current and former students at Rock Creek, I am Mrs. Buck, the computer tech, and tonight you will vote on whether or not I get to keep my job. The other day I was in a meeting where the hashtag RUSD Proud was displayed rather largely on the wall, and it had me thinking about what makes me RUSD Proud. I am RUSD Proud when a student who also participated in summer school comes running up to me because she found out she reclassified out of the English Language Development Program. I'm RUSD proud when students walk into the library and experience changes led by our elementary district librarian, <coughs> Kelly Steffen. I'm RUSD proud when my second graders shout out in excitement because they learn something new on the Chromebooks. And just today, I'm RUSD proud when my kindergartners learn how to use a Chromebook for the first time, and they truly feel like a big kid. But you know what would really make me RUSD proud? For you to table this vote and visit the staff and students affected by these cuts. See how an English language development class works. Talk to former summer school teachers and admins. Experience the elementary school libraries. You are always welcome to visit me in my lab and see what I do. Nothing would make me RUSD prouder. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Hi, I'm Olivia Moffitt, and I'm a resident of Roseville. I am a, I'm a senior at Rockland High School, and you might remember me from the last board meeting where I advocated for our arts programs. I'm so passionate about the arts because next year I'm attending college as a musical theater major, and even though I like student activism, I'm disappointed that I'm standing before you today, <laughs> like, again. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm extremely glad that the decision was made to preserve elementary school music as I participate in that program at Breen Elementary, but I'm not so glad that funding for replacement equipment for our VAPA programs across the board are still on the chopping block. Because I feel as though my peers and I were ignored last time we were here, I'm going to reiterate some issues that we brought up. VAPA programs already struggle to get by as it is. <coughs> we have 180 choir students, but a classroom that's far too small to fit all of us. Every single chair in our theater is broken. When the air conditioner was replaced, the repairman said that he couldn't believe that the theater hadn't burned down years ago. The lights in the aisles have been broken for years, making it a severe safety hazard. That's why I'm confused when the district says that they want to keep students and employees safe, because those hazards alone are not only dangerous to students and teachers, but also to the public who utilizes our theater. 
My question is how do you expect our VAPA programs to exist with no equipment? Band will have no instruments, art classes won't have supplies, dance and theater will have no technology, props, or costumes. Earlier today, I auditioned for our spring musical, A Midsummer's Night's Dream. After it was over, I took a moment and realized the fact that this was my last audition in our theater department. And all I felt was gratitude because I saw myself as a freshman so eager to be part of the program that I now cherish so fondly. If we continue to gut our programs like this, these classes will not survive. My cousin is a freshman and she just joined the theater department, and I'm scared for her. I'm scared that she won't have the privilege that I had to pursue what, um, the, the activities that allowed her to pr express herself. Superintendent Stock, you said that the board wants to increase attendance. I go to school because I look forward to chamber choir. I go to school because I look forward to theater four. Don't let students lose places at school where they can feel comfortable. We should want our students to be able to thrive. Don't let the arts die. Aaron Palumbo, Rockland. I had a couple of things I wanted to address tonight that were mentioned. Um, Mr. Miller, you said at times this is a time where we need to be prudent in spending in the budget. In the budget for 2018-2019, there was 338955 and this year there was 202647 spent on travel and conferences. Is that being prudent in a time we need to be? What exactly was that money spent on? Where did it go? Mr. St Mr. Stevens, you mentioned we, if we keep on this path, we will bounce checks like Oakland. Oakland is looking to, they have $53, $57.3 million annually spent on charters. That, along with San Diego at $65 million and San Jose at $19 million annually, that is bankrupting their school districts. So that's what's going to happen if we continue down these paths. Mr. Stock, you mentioned the CalPERS and CalSTRS contributions at $650,000 and a million for STRS. Um, that would be $402 million additionally in June. Well, according to your audit, it said that you received an additional $5 million in state PERS and STRS funding that must be recorded by the district. Along with this paragraph in your audit, it says, revenues estimated in the revised budget were more than the revenues in the original budget by $10.1 million, as the adoption budget did not include one did not include one-time mandated cost funding of $2.1 million, an additional $5 million in PERS and STRS funding that must be recorded by the district, the new low-performing student block grant of $671,000, $201,000 in Title I funding, $441,000 in lottery revenue, $666,000 in special education funding, and $177,000 in Medi-Cal funding. Again, these numbers are off. $10.1 million in your revised budget. Where is the money? We talked about the custodial services. According to the long-term housing agreement that was signed in December of 2018, they already agreed to take over these services. It's in page eight, number nine. During the permanent term, the RA and charter schools shall be solely responsible for providing and paying for custodial services at the Rugal facilities. They shall bear the cost of the custodial services, including the salary and benefits of the custodian and the cost of any cleaning supplies and tools necessary for the custodial services. So nothing really changed from that point. It's just. It just looks like you're just adding it to there when it was already taken care of. The enrollment always changes, and that's why it's hard for us to come up with that. The one thing I really want to talk about, you talk about collaborating with us. You don't. You don't give us any warning. You didn't do it for the Rukla stuff. You don't do it for this. You don't give us time to, to look through things, to communicate with us. Let us help you out. Let us be a part of the discussion. Stop shutting us out, and we'll keep our quality teachers in our schools and our students well taken care of. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Casey Corliss, uh, Rockland parent. Um, first, I want to say thank you. Thank you very much for saving the music program. I think that's a really important program, and it means a lot to so many people. As you heard, so many students and teachers and parents telling you that on the news at the last board meeting. So sincerely, thank you. But you're not a hero when you say we saved the sports program, because you didn't. The parents did. The teachers did. The athletic directors did. So that's a sham. It was a ruse to put the Rockland Academy custodial positions on the budget cuts when Rockland Academy was already obligated to pay for those, as the last speaker just said. 
Um, last year, you said you made a goal to invest in your employees and a goal to be inclusive. I'm not so sure that was heroic either, although it sounds good, because it seems like that happened, that goal, after a really long fight with a whole lot of these teachers about salary increases. And while you were at it, you decided to give yourself a raise. And then we sit here and we're talking, you said, on your board website and probably in some communications that went out, you're making a quote, deliberate effort to keep reductions away from classrooms and schools. I'm gonna list for you the things that you are cutting today that are directly related to the classrooms and to schools and to your employees and the students that you serve. Instructional coaches, sports, library, technician aides, ESL, your English learning, special ed, custodial, work experience program, summer school, VAPA, deferred maintenance at your schools. When we think about deferred maintenance, you um, say you can't allocate facility funds for construction for charter schools. I don't know if everyone knows what amazing accommodations are be given, given, being given to Rockland Academy at the tune of $18 million of this school's money for amazing facilities for the academy for around 600 charter school students. Instead of serving the masses, the thousands and thousands of Rockland Unified School District students who deserve modernization of their existing facilities. So that money can be used somewhere else. It can be used on district students instead of 600 charter school students. So I urge you to delay this vote today, to go back to the drawing board, to get the collaboration that you say you want with these people that you haven't done yet. To have that collaboration, these people, the parents, the athletic directors, the teachers, they've proposed some really good solutions in a short period of time to some of these budget crises you say you're filling, facing. So use that, leverage that, get help and insight on many of these things. Um, I think I have one other point to make. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Casey. Sylvia Bond, Rockland resident. I really thought I was going to just sit this meeting. I apologize. Um, but something got me, and I just wanted to give a little bit of input. I'm going to be focusing on the freshman sports. First of all, thank you. That was a huge win, and it affected a lot of students. Um, hopefully, Derek gets an ongoing conversation. Um, having to ask the parents to do more is a little bit much, and let me explain why. My daughter was uh, actually made the JV team, was asked to lead a freshman team. She made that decision for two reasons, to increase her leadership skills and to also allow five of the nine players who have never played an organized sport and a, and a chance to play. These nine girls saw other teams get warm-ups, bags, shoes. They were even told they couldn't buy advance tickets to the Whitney Rockland game because they were a freshman team. They still represented. They still wanted to play. They were 16 and 7 overall in third place for Rockland. <clears throat> now, um, this is a dedication. These are who you're working with. Now let's talk about money. Okay? I come from competitive world of sports. I understand you pay for these things. But it's a little bit different for high school sports, I think, and I don't think those are comparable. Um, this year, for the fundraiser, they were required to sell three tickets. That was $120. The tickets for a family of four, which we love to watch basketball, it's $25 a game. For all those games, that was about roughly $575 to watch my daughter play. If you do it for two, two parents, it's about $322 for the year. Snack bar, we are already required to work snack bar. Um, three, four, four hour shifts are required. I personally work 10 plus because there's no one there for freshman teams. They're there for JV, they're there for varsity, not for freshman teams. Um, we have no buses. We are driving two hours away because there's not enough freshman teams. So as these discussions keep going, no matter who's having these discussions, it's already enough on the parents. And I don't think that that's going to be um, a good option to, to relay that back to them. So something to consider. Um, also, knowing you guys a little bit more and, 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 and um, building our relationships, I just want to honestly say sometimes um, the public doesn't know what's happening and what's on your shoulders. They don't know that maybe you did not come up with these recommendations. You have the, the horrible task of deciding, sure, go ahead and do that. And it's a, it's a horrible place to be in, but you do have some power. And you're all very good at it, because I've seen you in action. 
I'm sure there is a way to delay a portion of it. I'm sure there is a way to say, we'll give notices to salary cuts instead of teacher positions. And if that doesn't work, we won't have to do that. You know, so you guys, you're wonderful at doing these kind of things. Let's think about that a little bit more. And unfortunately, you know, for those of us in the corporate world, and I, I, I don't mean disrespect, and I hope you know that from my relationships, but you're accountable for your decisions. And when we don't make numbers, when we don't, those are when cuts happen and salary cuts are done. So just something to think about. Thank, Thank you, Sylvia. Hi, my name is Vinny Kinda. I'm, uh, I'm here from Morocco. Got to say, it's uh, been quite a heartfelt message, and I got to tell you, having been a product of the public school system and the uh, education in English as a second language, thank you very much for what you guys did for my pro me growing up and uh, actually helping me learn English the way that I have, because it's actually a secondary language for me. Um, I want to share something with you. I'm here on behalf of my daughter, and she attends the Rika Academy because of certain medical conditions. And the budget for that supposedly is $50,000. What an arbitrary number that's been pulled out. And I got to tell, fantastic job on being able to put these historical numbers down. I wish I had the math teacher. <laughs> you are here now. Who knows, my math skills would have been probably a little bit better too. But thank you for putting this together. So this should be a reality check for you guys. The reality check is this. If history tells us anything, that these numbers are repeating and every projected number that you guys have said were going to occur, the projected losses didn't occur and there were potential surpluses or we didn't need to make those, make those uh, cuts. I don't know if you guys know what really a crisis is. Do you guys know why a crisis happens? A crisis happens when people are unable to control certain fears. And when we don't control those fears, our imagination runs wild and we have a harder time trying to comprehend what the next step is going to be. And that's what's happening here. From December to now, think about the crisis that's been created, but not just here, not here, but with the kids. My own daughter who attends that school has not been able to get out of bed with the thought that, that her school is gonna be cut and she's not gonna have a place next year to go because she's not able to go to school full time because of the medical condition she's going through. Why is that important? Because as a parent who has to deal with that on a daily basis, that's not easy. I've been watching every one of you guys so far but from back here, and I gotta tell you, I thank you for your engagement. I thank you for what you guys are doing. But I gotta tell you, Mr. Miller, Mr. Stock, I study behaviors and I look at how certain individuals interact and situations, and I gotta tell you, sir, you seem more put out by this meeting than anybody else here. You seem that you have checked out the moment somebody talks about there might be some errors, there might be some projected errors in what's taken place and what you guys have done, because you don't wanna hear the truth. You don't wanna know that, think that there's a possibility that when there's numbers that were said that you guys were off by 25%, 45% in making cuts here with the freshman team, oh, oops, yeah, maybe we were off a little bit. Maybe it was going to be 70,000, 50,000, whatever it may be. But making those decisions as irrational as you are, it's going to create errors in ways that you will not be able to take that back. If there is a surplus and these are errors, you will be held accountable. I promise you that. Don't let it happen. Take the opportunity. Take the opportunity. And if you can delay this, do it because it will be in your favor. These people will support you. But you make these decisions tonight and they, there is no uh, uh, surplus or the surplus happens, it's a win for you. And you don't want to do that. Thank you. Hello, board. I didn't plan on doing this. I'm actually working here tonight. In fact, I set up this shindig and I'm going to be tearing it down when it's all said and done. No, the reason I'm up here, my name is Jay Bradley. I've sent you a, a few um, feedbacks, if you have read them. Um, I'm the night float custodian. I'm the second one. Um, we have two. If we cut down to one, it's, I think it's going to be a severe mistake. I mean, we're cut to the bone as it is. Um, 
I just don't work at elementaries and clean elementaries. I mean, I'm a jack of all trades. Um, I work at the high schools, the junior high, whatever my supervisor, Taylor Mo needs, I do. I help him out a lot. Uh, I'll do deliveries. I've done maintenance work here, so they have to call the maintenance department to save them money. And any um, on a response team, any outbreaks. And you know, with the way the world is right now, and we all know what I'm talking about. I mean, it's a big scare right now. And if you cut our custodial help, and we need that emergency response team to clean, um, we're gonna be in dire straits, folks. The bottom line is, please do not cut our custodial department. We need it, we're, we're down to the bone as it is. And if you wanna keep you know, our schools, our kids, staff, you want to keep them healthy, I please advise that you just take another look at the cuts. And that's all I got to say, so I'm going to get back to work. And I got, what, about a minute 20 to spare. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Mr. Radley. Good evening, Colleen Crow, Rockland resident, Rockland High School teacher. Um, I just wanted to remind you that Joe's work shows the history of our district. In the 24 years I've been here, the sky is always, always falling. And the expenses are always, always overestimated. The savings that were projected in the uh, last board meeting were exaggerated. But I have a suggestion. We are going to see a retirement, I believe, in a top admin position. Don't replace that position. That would save you some money. Bring all salaries over $200,000 down to what the governor of California makes. Eliminate all contributions to TSAs. Eliminate a car allowance. Those things would save quite a bit of money, maybe your custodians, your library aides, your EL teachers. That would be helpful and a different way to go about this than it affecting the children in the classroom, the children in the libraries, the children with their health because of the custodial. I know it's a hard thing to be a leader and to say I should be the first one to give up, but that's what should happen. But like I said, I believe Joe's numbers. I believe that based on the data that you provided us, there really is no need to make any cuts at all. Because in three years, the actual um, amount in your reserves will go up because it has over time. If you look on the document that Joe gave you, I don't think you need to do any cuts. But those are some other ideas. Thank you. Thanks, Colleen. <laughs> OK. Anyone else? All right. With that, I will uh, open up for a board comment. We take a quick break. But we're going to take a break first. All right. So. Um, we, can we say 9.30? So six minutes? We'll sure. re resume at 9.30? Okay.
Okay, if we could, uh, if we could come back to, to order. All right, I, I know it's late, and I do deeply appreciate everyone hanging with us uh, for the next part of this conversation. So with that, I do want to uh, open up board comment on the item. So uh, colleagues, is anyone ready to, uh, I can tap dance a little bit. You ready to go? Sure. Okay, Derek. I get that it's a challenge. I get that it's frustrating. I get that everyone in the audience and everyone from every different group has a different perspective of take it from here, not from here, do it from there, do it from that. I think we're all faced with this $3 million gap that you got to find. Now, I think we've talked about it. If you don't find it now, it becomes a six, seven, eight million dollar gap later, and those are bigger cuts. But like any family in our community, you create an annual budget for yourself. You say, hey, maybe I want to fix the house, maybe I want to repair a car, maybe I have, and I do, I have a senior that's going to college next year, and you got to find that money and you got to start planning for that. So everything is a budget decision. If you choose one over the other, inevitably someone's going to be upset. Something, some party doesn't, doesn't make it. So as it comes up, it is a challenge. You have to plan for the oopses and the accidents. I know it's easy to say, hey, in historically, you've had the money, it's always coming in favor. I, I wish I could look back and I wish I could buy Microsoft in 1987. I wish I could have that foresight back then to make those purchases and I'd have a lot more money now. You identify the priorities up front, you plan accordingly, you budget for the oopses and the accidents, and I know at some point to some people that's a conservative thing to do. Don't, you don't need to put so much away, don't worry it'll come. But we're all here to look at all these different factors and based on the information that we have and the information that, that staff and people have provided, the numbers, the budgets, the assumptions and you have to vote on those as they come. So it's always tough to essentially say, hey, we're gonna pick this and not that. In just looking at the board documents that we have, I think it was the, the considered but not recommended, that's $3 million worth of stuff right there. So we could easily say, hey, you know what? All the stuff that's on that current list, now we'll drop that. But inevitably, student mental health, Schoology, and then all class size increases. In fact, we can get three million that way, but then I'm sure if we, if we chose that direction, there'd be another set of comments, another set of questions to the community. Hey, why are we doing this? Why are we dropping that? So I guess, and maybe I'm just complaining to myself, it's a tough decision you have to make. You have to pick something. Inevitably, not everyone's gonna be happy. I mean, the easiest way to look at it, if you really want to take a hard look at the overall budget, I mean, you got roughly, what is it, 84 million in salaries all the way across the board. I don't think it's fair to, if we're saying that we're investing in people and we're investing in talent and we're investing in, in the skill and the things that we want all the way across the board. So from administrators to teachers to custodial work, we're investing all those. It would be difficult to say, hey, everyone just take a pay cut straight across the board. That's not fair. So where do you take it? Inevitably, there's always going to be some cut somewhere, and I get it's a challenge, and I, and, and I appreciate the feedback, but you have, to make a direction, you have to make a decision based on a direction and then hope that come May revised, we get more money, and the decisions that we make tonight don't have to be impacted or affected in June or July or something like that. So, I, sorry to ramble, but just trying to tell you, like every one of us up on this part, you're trying to fit all this together. You're trying to make someone happy. And inevitably, no matter what decision we make, someone's going to be affected. Thanks, sir. I'll first make a comment uh, kind of just to the general public that this is 
a tough situation, and I agree with a lot of your frustration. I feel that um, it was amazing this week to see the engagement that we got. There were 519 responses, 79% were from parents, 11 from staff, sorry, 76 from parents, 11% from staff, 8% from students, and 5% from community members. Your opinion matters. These are difficult choices, but your opinion really matters. I read through every single one, and I'll give my colleagues benefit of the doubt that they did as well. I will say that our collective goal is to put our students first and remain fiscally responsible. The great news is that I feel like this is possible. I am not understating that this is a hard position that none of us want to be in. These are good economic times. This is Rockland, and it is why all of us moved here. I am still committed to the truth that great schools contribute to great communities. My hope is that this is possible. There are capable, <coughs> smart people that want to solve this and move forward. The magnitude of these cuts bothers me greatly. I acknowledge the work of so many to get to this point. Our job as trustees is to put students first, and these are hard decisions we now have to make. There are no rubber stamps. There are no conspiracies. There are no scare tactics. We sincerely are here. Our kids go to school here. We live here. We want things to be better. We want things to be amazing. We want to have great schools. I, I want to touch just for a second on music. Um, it was something that we've heard, you know, we heard overwhelmingly about music. And the more that I researched and got into this, for sixth and seventh graders, the current program that we have, although I'm so glad we kept it, only reaches 52% of kids. And to me, that's not enough. So this is a great start, but I want to see a long-term, much better plan for the future for music, where 100% of kids have an opportunity for music education. Um, I don't think this is going to be easy, but I do feel like it's something that we can commit to looking at in the future, and if we do get more money this spring, let's, let's not um, rule that out. I feel like, oh, thank you. Um, I feel like also I have a concern about the 45,000 cut to equipment because if we value a program, we've got to continue to invest in it. So I hope that this is a one-time cut and that we can continue to buy kilns. So the 30,000 for VAPA, we're not cutting VAPA, but that VAPA 30,000, that's a kiln. And so, yes, maybe this year we can get away with it, but in the future, we're going to have equipment replacement costs. A tuba is $10,000. So I, I don't, I, I hope that this is on the one time, let's keep this a priority moving forward, that we don't always um, consider this moving forward. I don't, I want, I want to continue to invest in music in BAPA. That's my comment for now. I'll have more. <laughs> Thank you. Do you have any comments? <coughs> I'll, first I'll springboard off of what Rochelle was just saying, I think. I definitely hope, I really, really hope we're able to have a conversation soon about priorities if we're able to rescind and restore some of this. I don't, it, it doesn't change my belief that we need to do what is fiscally prudent and we need to take very serious action tonight so that if things don't turn out better in a couple months, We've already started this process so that things won't be even worse next year. And that's the reality of, that we're grappling with with these ongoing budget cuts. But I agree, uh, music funding for equipment, like that would be an area I would want to look at as restoration. Uh, the comments we heard from students, not just tonight, but the previous night, raising safety issues, like I do hope, and, and I'm going to ask, and if we don't have all the information right now, I want to get some follow-up. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. I would hope that if there is any sort of critical safety issue like that, we don't treat that as a VAPA budget issue. That's just a routine restricted maintenance critical safety type issue because we can't have students in facilities that present 
any of that type of danger to their physical well-being. So regardless of what we may be voting on now, I hope things like if, if there are safety issues in the theater, in any of the music rooms, I would say this of anywhere on campus, like of the money that we do have in our facilities budget, I hope that is a priority. Oh, and Craig's walking up to respond. Thank you very much. Good evening. <coughs> You're right, Eric. Um, the routine restricted maintenance and deferred maintenance budget, um, if, if a piece of equipment is failed, like a kiln goes out, um, we would replace that as a replacing kind. And we, we maintain the kilns at all of our sites and you know do the regular routine maintenance on them every year. But if there's a HVAC unit that goes out, we, you know, we replace that also. Same type of procedure. Thank you. Um, a couple questions. One speaker was looking at prior budget information. Correct me if I'm wrong, was it last year that we did get additional one-time lump sum money from the state to go towards last year's increase in STRS and PERS, or was that two years ago? Uh, that was that was last year, and so sorry. That was last year, so okay. they um, they reduced the rate for our STRS, and um, but the STRS, the other piece of STRS where they said, oh, you've got. Five million dollars more. I, I think they're talking about the stirs on behalf that the state we have to record as a revenue and expense, so we don't get any money. It's an accounting entry. Got it. Thank you. Uh, that's another example where through the state's budget process, like that came along going into May, and we were able to say, "Oh, great! This turned out better than we thought." Yeah. It's not ongoing money, but they were going to give one-time money to help cover that year's increasing pension costs. But that doesn't change, for example, the overall picture that when the pension increases are fully implemented in a couple years, the contribution rate that we have to make on every dollar we pay in somebody's salary will have doubled, more than doubled. And that's happened at the same time we were ostensibly receiving more money from the state. That's a big part of the reason we're in this situation. We've got as I th think and I hope was clearly explained to the public today, we have rapidly increased, well, we've seen rapid increase in pension costs. We've also seen big increase in special education. Mm -hmm. Over the same period of time, our funding tanked, and then we got back to where we were right before the recession last year. But in that same period of time, you've seen spending on pensions double. You've seen spending on special education double. And we have also reprioritized by committing even more of the money that we do get towards salary and benefits for staff to recruit and retain. And we absolutely stand behind that, but those three big things take up more and more of the budget, everything else gets squeezed. And that's why we're here. And it, it makes me sad that we have to even talk about these cuts. But, if, but I do firmly believe that if we don't do what is financially prudent now, we are making a bet that the economy is just going to be dramatically better over the next year. And I'm not willing to make that bet because I don't think that's going to happen. And the pain next year would be even worse. Thanks, Eric. Camille, do you have any comments? Um, no. No? Yes. Well, no. Yes, but no. I mean, it's um, just as everyone's said. Um, just part of, you know, this is just the, the hardest thing that, what, that we come up against. Um, and so for me, uh, if everyone said, you know, look at music, look at whatever, I really want us to think about our, uh, our English language learners and how we deliver uh, the curriculum to them, I get that that maybe there are different ways we can do it. I just want to make sure that as we go down this path and look at how we are going to deliver that, that people feel supported, people understand, you know, that children feel supported. So it's a concern for me moving forward. 
we have targeted dollars. I want to make sure they're used in the very best way <coughs> that they can be. Additionally, uh, for me, on my list is, a di is the second district librarian. I think we've heard tonight a lot about uh, what uh, what the library the library aids ha the services they provide our students, but that comes from having a, a really good librarian to help direct that work. So that would be on my list to make sure that uh, we look at that. Is is I'm going to say I'm going to say we are going to. I'm just going to be optimistic and say we are going to. You know, in my head, yep. We're, this is, we're going to have another conversation where uh, we're, we, we're taking a different look. But that's on my short list, you know, um, to look at, look at those couple of places. Um, I apologize, Casey. We've already had public comments. We're just going to keep this to the board. Thank you. Sorry, go ahead, Camille. Yeah. So um, I wish I had these wonderful words of wisdom to make us all feel better about this conversation. I don't. I wish we never would have to have it. Um, but unfortunately, as you mm -hmm. all have said, part of our job is is to ensure that the district has funding, is fiscally responsible, looking down the road three years. I know that's, I know that's, that's not what um, folks want to hear, but I do believe that that's part of our job. So, that's all. Thank you. Uh, so, a couple things. I actually do want to just specifically speak to uh, a couple of areas. So, uh, with uh, EL in particular, so I appreciate your. The, the, I really actually appreciate you coming back with that better, with that information. It was <laughs> quite helpful. I fully understand the idea of embedding ELD um, into general education teachers. It's a great idea. It's a great idea, no matter what. Um, I'm not convinced it's a substitute. I understand these difficult situations. These are the tough things we have to make. But, but it, you use data to drive that decision. I hope that we're being purposeful and thoughtful about looking at the data from here on out to understand what impact this has and that we're going to have the ability to say, if it turns out we are, we, are in tr we are increasing gaps and we're seeing learning loss, that we have to have the ability to come back and rethink this. It definitely... <clears throat> I know training has begun this year, um, right. um, but I, it definitely is going to take a shift because some of it is, um, and, and it's in the frameworks, we right. should be using it language arts For sure, time. And, and the materials say and, it, I get all that. Absolutely, and. and the differentiation piece to still be able to provide that, and that is, and, and we believe we are still going to be able to provide that pull out. You know, I, again, those were... Um, to temporary positions, and um, <coughs> we were overstaffed in a couple of places, and um, so we believe that um, the impact won't be yep. felt. I appreciate that, but I, and and I know you're the, 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 the I understand that I appreciate it, um, but the notion of how are we going to know the, how, what, how we track what, what are we progress. looking at to see what actually happens and making sure we're clear up front what that data is. That's what I want to make sure we have in place. Uh, and the Thank same you. thing um, around, around both EL, the 2AL, and around summer school. Like, is we, if we're doing these, where, where can we look? If we see a greater, a greater uh, loss over that time, that we need to know that, and we need to think about that going forward. Um, and then the final, uh, well, then the other two things on that is one is around um, coaching, as I think I've mentioned, that deeply concerns me. The reason it concerns me is coaching is the, the oil, if you will, as someone said, to the, to the engine of learning. And if we are not a learning institution, we will not be an institution that gets better and improves. We all can get better, every one of us. And so the way you get better is you learn and you go through professional development. So this notion of this is what you're in charge, this is what your job does. 
And the notion that we would walk away from learning as an institution and we would not invest in that, that we would not invest in going places where we can actually learn and get better, that we would not invest as people in the classroom to help our teachers to get better, help our administrators get better. It's the exact opposite the direction we should be going. We have to make these difficult decisions in these hard times. I get that. It makes sense. It's better that than taking someone out of a classroom or potentially adding kids in the classroom. I understand all that. But doing everything we can to make sure that we remain a learning institution and we think about how we're getting better all the time. Um, the final thing I'll say and then make a general comment is also we didn't talk about the math, uh, uh, um, the extending out the math adoption, which I think does make sense. The other thing that I do want to just make sure is we obviously have a new set of frameworks coming on. It's, it's scheduled, the state's in the sort of final stage, it's scheduled to be adopted. Um, in the summer of 2021. It's probably going to take, if we're honest, a couple years for books to actually hit the, hit the shelves yes. uh, beyond that. But it really is actually, I hope, I think, a step in the right direction. A recognition from the initial time we brought Common Core on to where we are today, we've had a lot of learning about what works and what doesn't work, especially on learning progressions, especially understanding at, high, at high, sort of late elementary and higher level mathematics, the needs of the children are, and then how we go grade to grade to make sure we're learning along the same. We did not do a good job of those instructional materials, I would argue, in the first place. We have a chance now to do that. So if we're pushing this off anyway, thinking about how we recognize new materials coming on that are actually going to be superior than what we have in the market today, and thinking about how we factor that in, um, I think is going to be an important part of it. So let's try to look and see if maybe we can band-aid um, to, to get to that process. The final thing I'll say is just, a, uh, so thank you very much, I appreciate it. The final thing is just a general statement, and, and, um, and I agree with my colleagues, and I appreciate the conversation, and um, I appreciate RTPA's uh, conversation earlier, and I would say that um, I, I, I hear you, I understand this notion around, and I appreciate this notion around that, 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 that we've, uh, in the years past, been maybe too conservative when we look at the budget, and there's been huge reserves afterwards. Um, what I can say, I'm speaking only for myself now, is last year we made a decision where that didn't happen. We spent into our reserve, and I, I'm speaking for myself. I feel a particular obligation to make sure that I'm prudent as a result of that. What I will, what I will absolutely promise to you, speaking for myself, is that I'm going to watch too, and I'm going to see, did this in fact change dramatically? dramatically, and did we in fact, and then we can make adjustments and we can think about there. But right now, it's, I'm not, I, I, I don't, I'm not in a where I can take it away. I think the risk is worth it that if we're wrong, and in fact the budget is right, that we, we, we go out of reserve reserve and we actually be get qualified, which I think would be a disaster for our institution. So I just want you to know that's, that's from my perspective where I come from. But I say that to you, Travis, and I say that to Colleen and to Jeremy and the people here because I've <laughs> greatly appreciated the conversations we've been having in labor management, I deeply believe there's the possibility to go forward. I understand this is going to put us back, but I don't want to lose the momentum we have. We have, we have to figure out a way that we can engage together in meaningful ways. We're going to have hard times. We're going to have places we disagree. That's part of the process, but making sure that, and I think, frankly, um, while we might met, felt like we were making progress, this exposed where we still have lots of work to do. And I fully acknowledge that, lots of work to do. But I can just speak to you, I'm committed to making sure that we do it and figure out a way to go forward. Uh, you, you know, you, we, we're not gonna agree on everything. And like I, the vote tonight, you'll, for me, will not be the vote you want, but I am committed to make sure that we return to the table as soon as we can and start considering a conversation around how we can make sure that we have a different trust level going forward. So I appreciate that. Um, and that was actually uh, what I want to say. So sorry, Derek, did you want to add something? It's Real quick, just, just for a point of clarification for myself and maybe the rest of the folks, when the May revised numbers come out, do we validate, update our assumptions? Hey, we thought this was going to happen. Yes, it did. No, it didn't. It did, but it wasn't as bad, or it didn't, and it was better, or something like that. Do we have like a... We, we do. We okay. update. We will bring the, the changes back, and if the coal has changed, we build the the, main, the governor's main revise into our, our budget okay. assumptions. And then the same thing from like an attendance standpoint, we, we assume it's going to be right. this we'll and have, We'll have the P2 ADA in April, so we'll build that into okay. the budget and roll that forward. So, and I'm just asking, and I mm -hmm. think this is just goes back to the communication yeah. uh, mm -hmm. transparency type thing. Can we make sure that we... <coughs> when that does come out. Here's what we originally thought, and here's what it actually is. Good, bad, mm -hmm. otherwise. Mm -hmm. But I think that will help continue the conversation as we, as we have this, as, hey, our assumptions were good or our assumptions were bad, and we can take the learning from there. But, mm -hmm. but I hope, just hoping that we can communicate that out 
you know, across the board, whether it be a note in the, on the website or in conference or in discussion. But. And then when the state adopts a budget, because may revise it. Hundred percent agree. It, yes, that's the next. There are yeah, changes yeah. I'm again. Going the same right. place. Yes. We we have forty five days to adjust the, our budget to state adopted, so it's a continuous. I think process. just to keep the here's my because I all these financial models that you either do it in business or you do it in house. You make assumptions, and I think we just need to validate our assumptions as we go, yeah. and we take the learning from that. Thank you. Okay. Any other board comments or questions? Good. Okay. Uh, is there a motion on the um, on the resolution or the uh, back of the item? So I will move item eight point one. Is there a second? Second. Second. Uh, oh, seconded second. by Derek. Moved by uh, me. Uh, okay. I th think this is a roll call vote. Correct. Uh, if you. will Ben, if you read the roll, please. Camille Maben? Yes. Derek Counter? Yes. Eric Stevens? Yes. Rochelle Price? Yes. Uh, Rick Miller? Yes. Okay. Uh, moving on to 8.2, the resolution to reduce elimination of particular kinds of services pursuant to education code, uh, assistant soup uh, limotion. So based upon the current budget and reductions, specifically the vote we just had, and reductions in particular kinds of services programs, the district will be issuing a reduction in force or layoff notice to employees. Issuing notices and making other reductions will provide the district with maximum flexibility to meet its financial obligations for the 2021 school year. The resolution to reduce or eliminate particular kinds of service has been developed listing the service affected by the reduction in force. Staff is now presenting to the Board of Trustees for approval resolution 19-2015, a resolution authorizing the layoff of 19.67 19, um, 19 full-time equivalent FTE certifi cer certificated positions pursuant to Education Code 44955 effective June 30th, 2020. And just if I could be <coughs> verbose for a moment and direct you to the actual resolution, and not that Travis and I ever agree, but we have had a moment to sit down and walk through some of the pieces of this. I want to just highlight a couple elements of this, is that the, the res reductions that are on the resolution don't just, uh, don't just represent the votes and reductions that, you've, that you presented. They also represent uh, the reductions in RICA, which were voted the previous meeting, and also our annual reductions that we make based on our ADA or enrollment protections that we had. So not all of these are represented in there. A couple items I want to highlight in the resolution is the second paragraph is what we refer to as the competency language, which basically are the, the primary rights to bumping and how we establish these are all just positions. What my team will start doing, if voted, uh, voted will start doing, is determining the who would receive these layoff notices, and they're primarily based upon seniority, but also is based upon competency language, which you'll notice in the second paragraph, and also the second resolution that you will be voting on this evening, which is the tie-breaking criteria. So I just kind of wanted to structure with a, a timeline of pieces moving forward. So Thank you. without... Uh, any more, I'm going to say the recommended action is a motion to approve resolution 19 2015, a resolution to reduce or eliminate particular kinds of services effective June 30th, 2020. Great, thank you, Tony. Uh, board member comments? So, I do just want uh, one point that I wanted to clarify. So, my understanding of these uh, uh, notices and potential layoffs at the elementary level, while there is cost savings to us that we factor in as positive thing, we are making this decision and we are, we are doing these because actually lower enrollment, this is not a cost saving issue. This is about re having the number of teachers relevant to the enrollment we have. Yes. Correct? Okay. Uh, can I have a, a motion? To I can make a motion. Great, perfect. I'm sorry, but we, we said earlier that we were not going to public, uh, but we were not going to public comment on this because they just fall off in the budget. But we actually are welcome. If someone would like to say something, we're uh, we're happy to have public comment. Coming, truly happy to have public comment. So let me let me let me open it up for public comment. <laughs> truly, I'm, I'm, we're happy.
Yeah, no, I appreciate that. But again, the, the, well, okay, I appreciate that. Uh, is there a motion? I make a motion. Moved by Rochelle, seconded by? Seconded. Uh, Eric. Uh, uh, I don't know, please call the roll. Camille Maven. Yes. Derek Counter. Yes. Eric Stevens. Yes. Rochelle Price. Yes. Rick Miller. Yes. All right, Tony, you want to go to the next one? Sure. 8.3 is the resolution on tie breaking based on the budget reductions that the district is facing. It's imperative that the district issue reduction in force layoff notices for certificated employees in anticipation of further budget shortfalls. Seniority lists have been established and they are posted on our website and we're constantly updating them the best we can. Uh, and when more than one employee has the same seniority date, a tie-breaking criteria will be, uh, will be applied. The tie-breaking criteria has been developed and is ready for the board to review. So I'm directing you to, to the actual tie-breaking <coughs> criteria. It's important to understand that these aren't eternal documents. These are, were structured and created for this specific um, circumstance for the end of the school year and going into that. So it will look different than potentially the other ones and the recommendations were based upon. Uh, it's primarily giving points for having certain elements. So as we both discussed, most of the growth is occurring in secondary. So there'll be special points given to subject area, multiple subject area authorizations, uh, special points given to specifically hard to fill or recruit positions such as special education and career technical education. So that's how these were structured. So uh, the recommended action is a motion to approve resolution 19 2022, a resolution authorizing the adoption of the tie breaking criteria as the next step in the reduction in force for certificated employees. Thank you. Just real quick on that. Yes. Not specifically on the criteria. The criteria covers, <coughs> it's not just an elementary school criteria or a middle school criteria. It's a so where this really comes into play is what it comes, uh, like I mentioned, it's primarily based upon seniority and then you have competency language. But if the seniority date is the same for, I'm just going to make an example for uh, a bunch of math teachers or a bunch of uh, multi-subject elementary school teachers, this p is where points can be added or given um, to ultimately determine how to break that tie if they have the same seniority date. And it goes all the way down into even if two identical teachers even using the criteria still have the same number, it comes to basically a lottery system, which we would like to avoid. <laughs> Thank you. I don't want to say I'm proud of the lottery system piece, but that is an element. Any other questions, board members? Have a motion? So moved. Moved by Camille. Second. Seconded by Derek. Uh, why don't we please call the roll? Camille Maven. Yes. Derek Counter. Yes. Eric Stevens. Yes. Rochelle Price. Yes. Rick Miller. Yes. Mr. Moj. Yes. In accordance with Education Code sections 45101, 45114, 45117, 45298, and 45308, governing boards of school districts are authorized to lay off or reduce classified employees for lack of work and or lack of funds upon 60 days prior notice. Staff is now presenting for approval resolution 192016, a resolution authorizing the layoff of 15.887 full-time equivalent FTE classified positions pursuant to education code sections as I 45101, 45114, 45117, 45298, and 45308, effective June 30th, uh, 2020. And uh, Chuck and I also had an opportunity to go over this. Not that we, we agreed or anybody wasn't excited about this, but we did have an opportunity to review this and go over um, some of the positions that were on there. One of the significant differences between uh, classified and certificated, they don't have the same March 15th day. Yeah. Um, date, but what they have is a 60 day, but the intent of this yeah. language is that it will be a June 30th. Okay. Okay. Uh, any board member questions or comments? Uh, Chuck, are you, did you want to say are you good or? Oh, okay. Uh, any other public comment on this? Some of the cuts here are to the um, teacher positions that I spoke about before that have, or not necessarily teachers, but that have a direct impact on the schools, the teachers, the students, and the teachers' ability to do their jobs and their students' ability to learn. So I again strongly oppose this resolution that you're trying to pass 
and I pose a question to the board that I hope you will answer, which is when you get more money in May or June or whenever it is, when these other budget things come to fruition, who prioritizes the give back of these positions that you guys say are important to you, whether it be the librarian, um, music equipment, BAPA, et cetera, who gives, do we get to talk again? Do we get a say? Do you collaborate with the teachers? How does that work? The uh, pro the ultimate uh, decision, in, and that is the board of trustees. Um, I think you know the opportunity that we shared is a lot of for the community, a lot of public input at, at the board meetings that are upcoming on the budget is was requested by uh, trustees to update the board on uh, the assumptions as they change. And again, we hope for the positive that attendance is up more money from the state and those things, then as those conversations occur with the board, it also gives them an opportunity to give direction around uh, the input they want. The community also has an opportunity to do so, and, and we uh, think it would be beneficial to engage with our, our labor partners around their interest as well. And, and, and really, there's the goal is to gather as many as the different interests, whether community, labor partners, um, and others, to, and then the board looks at all those and then makes the ultimate decision. And so that's, that would be the goal, and that's where we, we are hoping folks come to board meetings. We've, uh, the board voted to live stream them as is being done now, and we'll continue to allow those that can't physically be there to see those changes and to be aware of them and also to participate in, in giving feedback. And we plan to keep our uh, budget online portal open to allow folks to, uh, community members, to continue to make comments as, as throughout the process. And the board trustees have a direct link to see those comments coming in live without any editing or, 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 or a process from staff. So we plan to keep all those so that we can continue <coughs> to gather input in, in more than one way. And, and then the board takes all those into account and, and really looks at um, you know, what are those options they want to do. And again, we are hoping that all of the assumptions go to the positive. We are hoping that there's more investment in public education. We hope more students come to our schools and we would be absolutely welcome that. And, and, and so uh, that's the process that would go and the board has the ultimate decision. Around yeah, so again, just for clear, obviously the five of us is the answer. We ultimately will make the decision of, uh, of if it gets provided. I want to be very clear on May 20th, we're going to have a board meeting where we're going to talk about the LCAP draft that includes the budget. On June 10th, we're going to have another board meeting where there's a public hearing about the budget and the LCAP. On June 24th, we're going to have a third meeting where we're going to adopt the budget. So in all three of those times, we will be talking about in around May 20th, a little before that, the governor will come out with his May revision that will give us more information of which to make budgeting, but ultimately the legislature has to make a decision. Hopefully that will happen shortly after that, early June. So by June 10th, June 24th, we should have a final budget and actual numbers from the legislature to make that decision. But there are multiple times public hearings along the way where we would welcome uh, and need public comment as part of it. In addition to that, I'm sorry, can I say one more thing? In addition to that, there's opportunities for public comment. That <laughs> My email's public. All of our emails are public. You and I messaged on Facebook all week. I welcome that as well. President Milburn, I have just a moment to add Please. a couple more pieces on this specific resolution. I wanted to make so, though I mentioned Chuck, who is the president of CSEA, this represents all classified members, yeah. which has three distinct groups, which right. is confidential, non-represented. Um, I think it's also important to note my team will be doing the same pieces, determining these are the positions, but potentially the who yeah. um, are almost exclusively um, seniority Great. based. Thank you for that. Okay. Uh, is there a motion on the resolution? Moved. Moved by Derek, seconded by second. Eric. Uh, yeah, Brenda, will you please call the roll? Camille Maben. Yes. Derek Counter. Yes. Eric Stevens. Yes. Rochelle Price. Yes. Rick Miller. Yes. Uh, Tony, I believe your last one. Yes. On February 5th, 2020, the Board of Trustees was presented uh, with the Rockland Teachers Professional Association 2020-2021 initial contract proposal and Rockland Unified School District's 2020-2021 initial contract proposal. Both were accepted. This is what we refer to as the sunshining process. The Board of Trustees set March 4th for the public hearing. The Board of Trustees is to hold a public hearing to accept comments from the public regarding the Rockland Teachers Professional Association and Rockland Unified School District. 
districts 2002 2020 2021 initial contract proposal and negotiations will begin following the public hearing so recommended action is a motion to the board to approve holding a public hearing and accept comments from the public great thank you tony any board member comments or questions travis do you have anything you want to add yeah, could i get a motion so moved moved by rochelle seconded by second camille uh please call the roll Camille Maven? Yes. Derek Counter? Yes. Eric Stevens? Yes. Rochelle Price? Yes. Rick Miller? Yes. Okay, Craig, I believe you're going to talk to us about uh, uh, facility fees. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. What? What do you mean? Oh, wait, wait no. 8.6. We need to open. Sorry, that was public hearing. Oh, you're right. Sorry. So it needs to be yep, yep. Sorry. Um, okay, uh, I'm going to open the public hearing and ask for. Wait. No, wait. No, I'm sorry. No, that was the, the RTP. We just did that. We're at 8.6. Oh, wait. Sorry. Apologies. Thank you very much. Uh, so we need to open the public hearing and ask for public comment regarding the 2021 initial contract proposal from the Rockland Teachers Professional Association and the Rockland Unified School District. So with that, I will open the hearing. Is there any public comment on the proposed contract language? Seeing none, I will close the hearing. Is that good? We're done? All right. Apologies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, good evening, President Miller, Board of Trustees, Superintendent Stock. Earlier tonight, the board approved the Development Impact Fee Study, Nexus Study 2020, which was updating and justifying an increase in the school developer fees, which were level one, from $3.79 a square foot to $4.08 per square foot. That's for all new residential construction, and from $0.61 cents a square foot to $0.66 excuse me, 66 cents per square foot for all new commercial construction, and that would be effective in May 4th, 2020. So we're bringing forward tonight a recommendation from staff to, to hold a public hearing, a motion to hold a public hearing with regard to the proposed increase in school development impact fees from $3.79 to $4.08 per square foot for all residential construction, and from 61 cents to 66 cents per square foot for all commercial construction, which would be effective in 60 days, May 4th, 2020. Great. Thank you. With that, I'm going to open a public hearing and ask for public comment regarding the increased school facilities impact fees on residential and commercial development effective May 4th, 2020. <coughs> Is there any public comment on these? Craig, excuse me. As we look to increase our growth in our district, have more funding for our students and the programs that are currently on cut uh, on the budget cut list, I'm not sure that increasing developer fees that are already crazy high is going to get the growth in Rockland that we want for new home development and commercial buildings. There's this really cool impact axe place where you throw axes. It's really fun. I went there. I was talking to the owner, and he was saying that he couldn't even afford to rent space off of the Highway 65 corridor because of the fees that he had to pay to be there. And so he landed over on Granite Drive, you know, kind of hidden in the back of the strip mall that's old. And it's an awesome place. I encourage you all to go. But uh, the developer fees are an issue for commercial businesses and small businesses that want to come here, that will move here with their families and bring their students and get the growth and the additional financing that we want. So I, I'm not sure this is a good idea. I'm not sure it's a bad idea either. I'm just, I really think that's a lot of money. Thank you, Casey. Any other comment for public comment? All right, I'm going to close the public hearing. Craig, can you maybe talk just a brief about what developer fees are? <coughs> right. So um, uh, developer fees are when they come in and they have to pay. Um, Who's they? they? And developers. Developers. So they're going to come in and they want to, to build. So the people that are developing the land, the people that not, not the ultimate landlord, not the person who runs the business, but the person who develops the land. Correct. So for each and lot, sells it. they have to pay a certain amount per square footage for anything over 500 square feet. And um, over at in Whitney Ranch, we have impact fees on top of that for $1,500 per lot on top right. of that for CFD3 up in the Whitney Ranch area. And then my understanding is there's a state organization or some organization that will allow you to charge a certain amount of developer fees. And they have said, based on right. their thing, that we actually could, we can be charging so more. So the for state allocation fees. board met in January. They meet every two years. And they take a look at the cost escalation, <laughs> and cost inflation, and they came up with this 
formula to increase the developer fees. We are a developer fee one. Um, there's two and three uh, levels. Um, we didn't qualify for developer level two or three because we don't have enough growth to justify going for developer two or three. So we're at the developer one rate at this time. What areas close to us are developer two or three? I know that uh, over at Folsom, they're, they're going for developer two and threes over there okay. um, because they have a lot of growth over in the 50 corridor okay. that justify that. Basically. So we're, we're going, we're going right. more towards the build out. Um, we actually took a look at this two years ago, if we would qualify for going for developer two fees. And uh, the justification from the report came back that we did not. We just don't have the square footage of land to, right. to push it. We're landlocked at this gotcha. time. So we don't so have enough Roseville to justify. In, the, in that Placer Ranch area or Folsom in that, where they're developing off of 50, they've got right. more land so they can look to push but, it. But it's important to note that we do have the, the growth for the next six to eight years to justify you know, the increase. increase. That, that helps us with our capital and you know, improvement projects. Because once we're built out, we can't ask for developer fees, correct? Right, right. Okay. right. Is this, sorry, do you want to go ahead? Is this uh, $4.08 per square foot competitive with our neighboring communities? Yes, that's, that's what the state is required for level okay. one fees. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Can I get a motion on that? Uh, or, I think this is just the public hearing. No, we've done that. I, I think the next one is the... No, I opened and closed the public hearing, right? Or did I not? So then I think it's... Sorry. It's the resolution. So then I think it's technically the next agenda item is to actually approve the resolution to increase. Good thing right. we have an attorney. I see. So we're not voting so on this. So we're just moving on. We're moving on to 8.7. Now, 8.7 okay. is to actually... Okay. So, can, but can I get a... <coughs> Right, but can we not we ask for a motion on that? On that? On 8.7? Yeah, so I, I asked for a motion on uh, 8.7. So moved. Moved by Trustee Price. Second. Seconded by Trustee Counter. Uh, can we get a roll call vote, please? Thank you. Camille Mabin? Yes. Derek Counter? Yes. Eric Stevens? Yes. Rochelle Price? Yes. Rick Miller? Yes. Uh, okay, 8.8, .8. we can uh, do this quickly. I know I have Severin Stock if you want to talk, but basically CSBA has put up one person uh, to run for a delegate assembly, and so we can, uh, I asked for a motion to approve that person. We would just be supporting the one only person running in our area. So is okay. there an interest in supporting that person? Sure. Moved by Eric Stevens, second by second. Trustee Counter. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Although this is opposed. Any abstentions? <laughs> Motion passes. Okay, uh, as we move forward, are there any items that uh, board members want to place on pending agendas? No? Okay, and uh, with that, uh, I want to thank everyone again for staying with us. I realize I it was a long night. Appreciate the conversation. And again, I just want to remind everyone that we will not be adopting our budget until June. There will be multiple hearings along the way, and we look forward to uh, continuing the conversation. With that, this Wednesday, March 4th, 2020 meeting is now adjourned. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming.